We do have Spanish translation available. Esperanza Villegas, would you please come forward to introduce yourself? Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Esperanza Villegas y esta noche estoy aquí para traducir. Si alguno de ustedes necesita ayuda, me puede encontrar en la parte trasera de esta sala. Gracias. Thank you. Um, we do have headsets available for the hearing impaired. And um, at this point, we'll move to introductions, proclamations, presentations, or recognitions. Well, we do have one presentation. And with us tonight are students from Dos Pueblos High School. Dos Pueblos High School principal Mark Swanitz. There's Mark over here. Uh, with teacher Jacqueline Kellerman. And students are here to share information about their photography program. Mr. Swanitz. Well, thank you for the opportunity to come before the board and share one of our exciting programs at uh, Dos Pueblos High School. Uh, I'll uh, preface my remarks in, uh, with, with the fact that uh, when Jacqueline Kellerman came to us two years ago, I asked her, you know, do you think you could teach photography? And she said, I've never taught photography before. I'm sure I can do it. And uh, in the two years that she's been with us, she has done amazing things with the program. And the kids are soaring to new heights and getting all kinds of recognition and, and honors and rewards. And when uh, Mrs. Kiani gave me the opportunity to bring one of our programs before you uh, to present, I uh, didn't even hesitate a minute before I thought the Day in the Life DP exhibit at Dos Pueblos High School, which is just concluding, uh, would be a great thing for the board to see. So we don't even have, you don't even have to come out to DP to see it. We brought it to you. So with that having been said, I'd like to introduce uh, Mrs. Jacqueline Kellerman and her students. I'm Jacqueline Kellerman, and these are my students. Um, I'm going to say your names and then raise your hand. Um, Geneva, Susie, Tyler, Tommy, and Sarah. Um, I'm here tonight to, uh, to just share the accolades of these students. Um, they've um, accomplished so much in the time that, um, that they've been studying photography, and um, we're just really excited about our program. Um, so much has gone on. So what I'd like to do is show you, um, show you a slideshow. I'll talk during that time, um, and then my students will have a chance to talk and um, share things as well. So um, to begin with, um, uh, I'll show you a, about a minute's worth of a film that um, several of my students, uh, Geneva, Susie, and Sarah, uh, created. Um, this film um, is a story about two students at DP. Um, one is a student in the special ed program. Um, she, is, she has a very rare condition where she's missing half of one of her chromosomes. Um, and her developmental process is very, very slow, um, physically, mentally. But we found that through music, um, she's been able to grow tr tremendously. Um, my students put together a 10-minute film, so you'll only see just a, a little portion of it. But um, since then, this film is um, now going to be circulated in the medical community. Um, it's going to be shown at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. And um, we're just very, very proud of it. So um, we'll show you a minute of it, and then we'll go on. I'll go on to explain it. And then um, you'll see the photos afterwards. Right, so you'll we'll, you'll start to see um, photos from our photojournalism exhibit. But I'd like to, um, in the meantime, um, while your eyes are affixed onto the screen, um, talk to you a little bit about the the film. Um, 
Prospero and Issa are two students at DP, and they, um, um, two very different people, and they were able to come together through music. Um, and it's just beautiful that um, my students had the vision to, to see um, this going on on campus. Um, it was, in, and to actually capture this in an art form. And since then, you know, like, as I've said, it's, gone, it's going on to be circulated as a study um, for research, for medical research. And um, you know, it's just a really uh, exciting thing. Um, these are photos from our photography exhibit, from our photojournalism exhibit um, that we put on in the classroom. They, um, my students went around the campus into all of the classrooms and took photos of life at DP. And what that did was it drew the school together. Um, it caused us to, um, to capture uh, the beauty of Dos Pueblos, and, um, and they've, they've really done an amazing job. Uh, and it just, uh, and this was one of the teachers dressed in the, at, um, dressed up for 1950s days. She doesn't really dress like a, <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't need to go to uh, what not to wear. Uh, but uh, but um, it's really beautiful because what, what happened was it, it caused the school to come together. So we, um, we opened our classroom up for four days and we, we exhibited these photographs and, um, and many others, the, all, actually all the photos that you'll see tonight. And um, uh, it was so beautiful because it caused, it caused people that you wouldn't normally um, come in contact with, um, just come walk into the classroom. I think even yesterday the exhibit was down and one kid just strolled into the classroom and just needed to look around at the walls and it was pretty exciting. But um, uh, we've had, we had a ton of classes come in. Um, the, the, uh, we had one um, uh, uh, Sadai class come in and they ended up writing me letters and one girl said that um, it caused her to, to stop and to take, to, um, to look at DP in a different way and to, to walk slowly through D DP from now on. And it's not, um, this is the result of these incredible students. Um, I'm only, I'm the guide, but um, these are, this is the, the vision of these incredible students. And um, I'm, I'm just so proud because, you know, this, this takes higher level thinking. It takes, um, it takes uh, an eye for composition. It takes, um, it takes just being able to see in a deeper way and to express, your, express themselves in the language of art. And um, so we can look at this as, as, a, as a language, as a language of um, a, visu a visual language. Um, many of my students here have, uh, have had incredible accomplishments. <laughs> um, I'll begin with Sarah Friedland. <coughs> um, she entered a film into the Santa Barbara Film Festival and was a finalist um, with her film. Um, she's the president of, actually, Geneva and Sarah are the presidents of Photography Club. Um, she's also, Sarah has also um, <coughs> worked endlessly to put together a magazine of both art and literature. Do we have the local color magazine? <coughs> oh, I'm gonna run. Um, uh, here, uh, we're actually putting together a magazine here at school of both art and literature, poetry, um, essays, music, and so that also ties in the, um, the DP community in a deeper way, um, um, not only through fine art, but gathering different subject areas together and, um, and so we can become a closer-knit community. So the beauty of, of this program is that we're reaching out to communities in our, we're reaching out to the community, we're um, helping one another, um, we're sharing insights, um, interdepartmental insights, um, trying to reach out to all of the classrooms and sharing our own visions. Um, Susie, um, Susie's 
photography has gone on to state um, for the reflections contest, so we're, uh, we're very proud of her for that. Um, we have uh, Tyler's, uh, do, you, is the, do you have the front cover of the, um, we have, well, this is actually one of our students' work on the front cover of Family Life magazine, so woohoo-hoo. Um, <laughs> and then we have, we have a spread on the inside as well. Um, so we're, we're just very, very proud of our program and um, the beauty that it's, that it's putting out. Um, do you guys have anything that you'd like to share? Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I think one of the great things about the program Ms. Kellman has created in the past two years is that with digital technology, it's really easy to just take snapshots all the time. But Ms. Kellman has um, made photography thought of as more as an art at DP, and there are five periods of students, and she has hundreds of students who are learning not just to take little MySpace pictures, but to really keep the art of photography going even in this digital age. And so I think that's really a great uh, mark of a wonderful art program and teacher. So, yeah. Oh, thank you, Sarah. Miss <laughs> 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 um, Kellman's program is really great because she's not just teaching everyone like the basics. She really gets personal with each student. Like, I mean, for even me, I really want to do photography as my career, and she has taught me like each individual little thing like on the computer or how to burn or dodge stuff in the dark room like it's really personal and it's not just oh I'm taking this photography class so I really enjoy it so in um, uh, we see that um, art often gets um, um, it's one of the first things to to get shuffled under the rug, but it's such a viable resource, and um, we're just we're just so proud of the beauty that it's um, um, so proud of its beauty, and uh, many of the students are going on to um, to um, art colleges um, to study photography as a career. Um, we have uh, Tyler has a book of his own photography, um, and uh, <laughs> and um, it's. Uh, we're just very proud. Um, that was my last slide. Um, <laughs> famous Bob, uh, I don't know the guy's name. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Mrs. Kellerman, you may not have been doing this for very long, but you're clearly doing a great job. So thank you. And students, your work was beautiful. And you'll be able to see yourselves on TV on Saturday at 5 o'clock, Channel 18, if you want to see how it looks on the little screen, although I don't think it will capture it uh, uh, to in the same way that we've been able to see it here. So it's, it's really lovely stuff, so thank you. Thank you. We're just gonna yes, like all right, thank you. Great, thank you so much, can, students. Can yes, and uh, Mr. Heron? Yeah, as long as Dos Pueblos is here and Mark, you're here, I'm not sure what you're doing out there, but your students are doing great. Uh, here's a laundry list. The DP News just came back from Florida and and they didn't win, but they mainly because they had too high tech. You're, they're too too good. Yeah, that was an interesting article. They're too good. Uh, virtual Enterprise is getting awards. I think your mock trial team did something uh, fantastic. <laughs> yep. uh, Annie, I went to see Annie. It was absolutely unbelievable. I couldn't I couldn't believe the facial expressions on all the actors and actresses. It was unbelievable. The Jazz uh, Day, the mathematics team. The science team going uh, to Washington, D.C. In, in April. I mean, that's a laundry list of success that is absolutely tremendous. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. appreciate that. Thank you. Um, any others for introductions, proclamations? No. Okay. Should we go on to the superintendent's, superintendent's report? report then, yes. Board, I'd like to start by making some comments about our fiscal situation. I know that the economic situation in our state, our nation, and indeed the world creates anxiety for all of us. Deputy Superintendent Eric Smith and I have been meeting with our staff school by school and other stakeholders to describe what we're doing to ensure our district's economic health during the state and global crisis and to get their input on how to enhance revenue and how to cut expenses. 
the district's via fiscal viability is good. We have a reserve that will help us to weather the crisis, but we're forced to make budget cuts this spring to ensure our ongoing viability. If we use nothing but uh, that reserve, uh, it would be gone this next year. We have been planning around the state's budget problems for the past year, and we got ahead of the problem. We made $4 million in cuts. I believe it was $4.1 million in cuts just last spring. Most of the cuts did not affect people or programs. We built our one-time reserve and we prepared to weather the state crisis, but we did not anticipate that the state crisis would be five times worse one year later and far worse with no end in sight for a number of years to come. Other districts are being forced to make huge budget cuts and lay off many employees just to stay afloat, and I'd like to comment on some of those in a moment we are actually in better shape than most. Still, we will need to make additional cuts and use some of our one-time reserve to maintain fiscal viability, especially on a multi-year basis. We sent out fewer layoff notices this year than we did last year. We will be making fewer budget cuts this year than we had to make last year. And the board will be able to consider a number of options in April that avoid cutting programs and people. And we'll continue to move ahead in pairing expenditures in alignment with reduced revenue and declining enrollment. We're working to find cuts that do not affect people or programs, although it's difficult in a budget with 84% of the budget going to salaries and benefits to find $3 million in budget cuts that do not affect people or programs, especially after last year's cuts of $4 million. News of budget cuts for school, for the school year 2009-10 is coming in from all over the state. Let me just read what some other districts are being forced to do. And this is just a sampling. I, I didn't see any good ones. Um, Anaheim with 19,000 students is making over $10 million in budget cuts. Madera with 19,000 students is making over $5 million in cuts. Roland Unified, a Los Angeles County district with 18,000 students, is making $9 million in cuts. Santa Maria Bonita School District with 13,000 uh, 13, students excuse me, is making $7 million in cuts. Tracy Unified with 17,000 students is making over $15 million in cuts. Turlock Unified with 14,000 students is making over $6 million in cuts. And as these districts come in, if they're anywhere near our size, then I'll be reporting that to you. Well, as I said, our cuts will not be as severe as many other districts, thanks to the reserve we've built. Uh, but our need to make $3 million in cuts is just as critical to our fiscal solvency. We will be discussing possible budget cuts at our next board meeting on April 14. And I have every confidence that the board will make good decisions as we move forward as a school district. We will continue to provide a sound fiscal base so we can focus on instructional effectiveness and learning. Related to this, in our discussions on budgets and layoffs, there's one area I'd like to make very clear. I know that a lot of news reports lumped the layoff notices sent out to permanent positions, people in permanent positions with those uh, who are in temporary positions. And first of all, I'd like to note that we value our substitute teachers very much, our temporary teachers. But we cannot give them permanent positions when they're holding positions for people who have rights back to those positions. Uh, so there is a difference, even though we've relied on many of them for a number of years to provide great service to our kids and their families. A copy of the newly released budget facts, the impact on the state budget on the Santa Barbara School Districts is included in your board materials. It's on the side table and it's uh, in the foyer. Robin Sawaski and I, on another item, Robin Sawaski and I just spent two days with our principals and education service directors focusing on standards aligned instructional leadership. 
each of our schools, as you know, in, in reviewing their single plans for student achievement is targeting student achievement and instructional improvement, professional learning communities, and their pyramid of interventions for student learning. We expect to return from spring break redoubling our efforts on student achievement. Today, uh, school administrators as well as general education and special education teachers completed a two-day Section 504 training with Laura Shulkin here in the boardroom. We have started recruiting for the position of the Executive Director of Special Education and we will soon advertise the Director positions. We are advertising the position statewide through the Association of California School Administrators the California Association of Pupil Personnel Directors, and the California SELPA Administrators. In addition to the statewide postings, we're conducting national recruitment through the Council for Exceptional Children. The new special education resource parent, Rosa Lazarovitz, is ready to begin work. Rosa is unable to be here tonight, but we will be introducing her to the board at the next meeting. I thought I'd get a smile. <laughs> Over the weekend, Mr. Heron, though I think the only thing you didn't report for Dos Pueblos High School was their great weekend at uh, California Mock Trials the State Tournament, where the team ended up 13 out of 35 teams. Each of the teams were winners in their respective county championships, and two of the Dos Pueblos team members won the individual state championship awards for best witnesses. I should take some lessons. Congratulations students and mock trial coach Bill Woodard. On tonight's agenda, the board will be selecting the seventh member of the Measure I 2008 Elementary District Parcel Tax Oversight Committee. You have uh, a list of, of those committee members. I need to tell you that unfortunately, we recently received notice that the Senior Citizens Group representative to the Measure H 2008 Secondary District Parcel Tax Oversight Committee is unable to serve. So we'll be noticing that and we'll be opening the position. We'll come back to the board for further discussion on filling the position. The board brief. My office regularly issues a report to the board called the board brief. It's a collection of reports and articles on school and district matters. A copy of the March 13 board brief is on display in the reception area or can be provided through the superintendent's office. And in upcoming events, board members, I think you have a list. I think Theater Fest is over on the side table. Our secondary school spring theater performances are underway. Copies of Theater Fest 2009 are located in the back of the room. In April, La Cumbra will perform Copacabana. Goleta Valley will do Pirates of Penzance. Santa Barbara High School will perform Footloose and San Marcos will present Man of La Mancha. San Marcos High School's wind band concert and dessert fundraiser takes place tomorrow as the band members <laughs> prepare for the New York Wind Band Festival on April 8 at Carnegie Hall in New York. That's a big one. Special events are happening this Thursday at Santa Barbara High School. We have career day. Uh, I know a couple of the board members will be there. Goleta Valley Junior High's Orchestra and Jazz Ensemble Concert will be this Thursday, and McKinley Elementary's All School Art Show this Thursday. La Cuesta Continuation High School's Iconic Portrait proje Project will be on display at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art from March 27 through April 10, and San Marcos High will hold its annual All Student Art Show from April 10 through 16. And that ends the superintendent's report tonight. Phew, a lot of information tonight. Thank you. Um, we move on to item C2, the announcement of closed session action. Uh, we do have one item to report out, item B4. There was a liability claim with the claimant, David Gilbertson. It was moved by board member Cordero and seconded by board member Deakin to reject the liability claim that passed 4-0 and Dr. Noel recused himself. Um, we will now move to item C3, which is public comments. <coughs> we have uh, 
20 requests to speak, and I think... Um, Normally, the board only allows 20 minutes for comment. Um, it is hard for speakers to only have one minute. Uh, with the board's permission, could we give them two minutes and run um, comments longer since this is somewhat of a shorter agenda? I hope that would work. Yes. Okay. Um, so we'll leave that with Mr. Heron then. First is Dr. Lavander, oh. followed by Laura, uh, uh, Ms. Pomerantz, followed by Kate Smith. And okay. All right, so y the timers, you should see it also on the podium, and you have two minutes. I'll Thank try you. to keep it as brief as I can. So my name is Dr. Jan Levander, and I am a parent, and I have two girls. One of them goes to Washington School, and we hope to transfer our second daughter in there. But it seems to be some snafu that we are not automatically allowed to keep families together. And I really urge the school board to think this through, because imagine yourself because we struggle to have two parents and two girls to go to the same, same school. And if we have to take them in different directions, things get very difficult. Mm -hmm. And imagine if, God forbid, there would be some single parents out there that would be facing this situation. So please let us keep families together as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Pomerantz. Good evening, thank you. My name is Laura Pomerantz. Um, I am a Washington parent with a child, Sienna, who's in second grade. We are an intra-district family. Um, I hope tonight that I'm able to illustrate and give a face to who we are. My son, Aiden, is a bright, happy five-year-old who is thrilled to join his big sister at Washington this fall. I am here tonight on behalf of our family and the 12 to 15 or so other families whose children would be torn away from Washington School as a result of the policy. I understand you will be voting upon April 14th. So who are we and why are so many of us up in arms over the latest policy changes which have once again come at a time when it's too late to find an equally satisfactory school for our children to attend? We are families who have become an integral part of what makes Washington School so special. We are working parents who also work in our children's classrooms. We are board members of our PTO. We have children in the GATE program. We have all worked in some way, large or small, to help make our school excellent academically as well as socially for all students at Washington School. We are not coattail transfers. We are like-minded parents who share values, not just a school. Our lives have been delicately woven into the fabric of Washington community. We are committed to building a community where our children can learn in a safe and nurturing environment. We are parents who would like to remain supporters of our public schools. I realize that you, the board, have made and will continue to make some difficult decisions due to budgetary constraints affecting our district. I also realize it is impossible to accommodate the 48 trans seconds, please. transfer request for Washington kindergarten. However, to group the 12 to 15 families that have currently have children currently attending Washington with the new families that are re requesting admission is not only unfair, but frankly, it's my opinion that's an anti-family policy. In addition, raising K classes to 23 puts an unrealistic burden on already overstressed K teachers. Can you I'm wrap it up? Thank yes, you. I'm therefore asking for your vote to keep the classroom size to 20, to keep the four K classrooms intact and to further allow the 12 to 15 families who currently have children attending Washington School to allow the kindergarten children to join their siblings and to keep our families together. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Smith, you have two requests in. Uh, one came too late for the closed session. So can you combine both of them in your two minutes? Sure. Uh, it's really nice one, to see One second, Kate, then we won't count this against you. Uh, followed by uh, Mrs. Lapkin, Ms. Lapkin, followed by Ms. Gascioni. My name is Kate Smith, and I ran for the Santa Barbara School District to expose corruption, and I have. I contend that there is a disconnect between the administration and our schools. I contend that the school-to-prison pipeline, which criminalizes the lower socioeconomic, Hispanic and black 
struggling in school students is institutionalized racism. And I ask that everybody visit SB School Talk. On March 16th, there was a special education parent meeting uh, invited to come and talk to FICMAT. It was a Latino uprising, uprising. There is a revolution in our society against a bloated administration, not just in our largest and most important industry, education, but in our government as a whole. So, I am also your parent representative to the Santa Barbara SELPA CAC. I'd like to announce that Bill Cerrone is going to be retiring, and he's very interested in dismantling the SELPA. One part of the SELPA already pulled away, that was the Santa Ynez Valley Consortium, and he's asked uh, Brian Sarvis to pull the Santa Barbara SELPA away from the central SELPA because Dr. Jerese Butterfield is ethical, and he is trying to fire her, and he can't. Bill Cerrone is a Machiavellian. He leads the school industry for not only California, but for our nation. 20 seconds, Mrs. Smith. And he's doing a cover-up. There is collusion and conspiracy in an unholy alliance of the schools, juvenile justice, and the 47 nonprofits that feed at the public funding trough. We need to slash the administration budget, bring down the administrative money so that Kay. we have child-centered, okay. child-centered, teacher-directed, and parent-involved schools. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Ms. Lapkin, followed by uh, Ms. Gaskillon. Good evening. My name is Jackie Lapkin. I've been a teacher at Adams for 19 years. I would like to share my concerns about your recent decision to reassign our principal, Marge Variano. I've seen many changes in teaching trends, site, and district policies. All of these changes have been challenging, but the specific leadership changes have impacted our school dramatically. Despite this, we have remained a true family when your decisions to remove our leaders impacted our reputation and programs. We're not sure we can recover after this latest decision. After you needed Joanne Keynes to save La Cumbra, you hired Matt Zukowitz. Our dedicated and professional staff worked together to maintain the high quality educational programs that we had to offer. We especially tried to keep our gate cluster status, yet that has been lost. After that job proved to be too challenging, you trusted another panel of our staff to choose a new leader. The team complied with the process and was happy to support Marge Variano. She came with many new innovative ideas and vast experiences, especially in the area of language arts. For example, Marge put together the Adams Reading Lab based on guided reading best practices. And so our failing students could learn how to read at their level, not at the district standards, and feel confident. This year, we are faced with many budget issues, transfers, and policy changes accompanying the district's program improvement status. We have never seen so much confusion and changes in decisions at the district level, especially in the areas of ELD and the report card implementation. We have tried to adapt to the weekly or monthly changes that have come from the process. Many miscommunications were made, and now you are unfairly putting the blame on Marge. If there are certain staff members with personal issues, the majority of our staff feels and supports Marge as our principal. We feel you have unfairly judged her and we think you're afraid she's challenging the system and policies that may need improving. We've hoped you would have reassembled, reassembled our interview team to get feedback from the staff and parents before you made this decision. If there are valid concerns that we are not aware of as a site, could you please address them and provide support to fix Thank them you. so that we may move on in a positive direction. Thank you very much. Leslie, followed by uh, Mrs. Kuhn. Hello, my name is Leslie Gascoigne, and I'm a fourth grade teacher at Adams Elementary also. I wrote a letter expressing my frustration with the recent decision taken by the superintendent regarding our principal. Unfortunately, I'm limited to three, uh, two minutes now, and my letter is longer than that, so I would like to read some of the key points and submit the entire letter at a later date. This letter has come to fruition because the recent decision made by the Santa Barbara School District to move our principal. We see this as a failure to carry out 
the mission statement. The Santa Barbara School District is out of compliance with its own core beliefs and commitments. The mission statement is, the mission of the Santa Barbara School Districts is to ensure the educational success of all students through high expectations and a commitment to excellence and to empower them to reach their full potential as responsible, ethical, and productive citizens in a diverse and changing world. At the core of all this are the children and their educational success. We seem to have lost sight of this goal and the negative effects that some of our decisions, like removing our leader, have on their fragile development. It is our job to protect them and provide the stability they need in a rapidly changing world. Core belief and commitment number one, we believe that the achievement of the district's mission is a shared responsibility requiring the cooperation and commitment of students, parents, staff, board members, and community. A shared responsibility requires teamwork beginning at the top with the board and the superintendents, <coughs> filtering down to each and every child. That sense of team building seconds. and fair play has virtually disappeared in the Santa Barbara School District. Now there is fear and mistrust between the upper management and the teachers. This is an added stress to an extremely difficult job. Inevitably, this affects the children and their educational success. Recently at Adams, we were informed that our principal was being released in June. This untimely decision was made by the superintendents need to ba wrap it up. based on their opinions and the complaints of a minority of our staff. It comes at an extremely volatile time for schools with large budget cuts, layoffs, and program improvement requirements. It was neither shared nor, co nor cooperative. Many concerned and involved people were ignored. Thank you, Thank Ms. Gascoigne. I can't read the clincher, but it's way better than what I just said. <laughs> well, we'll look forward to reading your letter. Ms. Kuhn, followed by Mr. Melton, followed by Mr. McKenzie, or Ms. Uh, Ms. McKenzie. Good evening. I'm very uncomfortable up here, but I had to come up also to talk about Marge Barriano, or forever hold my peace. We were told that we were for too far along in the process to stop or reverse the decision, and I went home and thought about that, and I thought, well, even people on death row have an appeal process, so that's why I'm here, to appeal to you to listen. I can't defend our principal because I don't know what she's accused of or what the perceived shortcomings are. I just know that I can tell you about the principal I know. She always puts the needs of her students, teachers, and families first and has worked tirelessly to build a strong school. She's a champion of special needs students and has streamlined SST so we can get interventions and support and help everyone be successful. Again, our reading intervention lab has really helped the struggling reader and those kids who might fall through the cracks. When we changed and got a new report card, she worked to make sure that we all were hooked up to the internet and had a computer that could handle the program and put one on in our hands. When the Modoc apartments were gonna close to be converted to condos, she worked with all the agencies. This affected 70 of our families and it was at holiday time. And she wanted to make sure they had food on the table and some of them had also lost their jobs, and she wanted to make sure there were gifts under the, table, uh, under the tree. This is her spirit of giving. She recently rallied a lot of our parents to help beautify the school, and they planted and landscaped and, and planted beautiful things. We're very proud of our school. She's escorted countless parents around the school, showing what Adams has to offer and to make them welcome in her neighborhood school. 20 seconds, Lisa. These are just some of the traits and accomplishments of our principal. And I think you have a winner with her, and I don't want to start again. I think if you find a new principal, there's a 50-50 chance of it being successful, and it's a terrible time to take away our leader. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Melton, followed by Ms. McKenzie. I sat down this last week and I wrote a letter when I heard that Ms. Fariano was asked to leave Adams. I'd like to read it. I am a mom of a third grader at Adams. It is my understanding that Mr. Sarva asked for Ms. Fariano's resignation. For reasons no one knows at this point, Ms. Fariano has stepped into Adams and has been a great leader. After all, that's what a, president, a principal is supposed to be. Great leaders are not liked by all. What makes a great leader different from other leaders is that they make positive changes. They listen to the people they are leading and fight for what they believe is best for the people. 
during a recent meeting when it was brought to the attention of the staff at Adams that Ms. Feriano was asked to hand in her resignation, teachers protested. They asked to work with Ms. Feriano for another year to help her improve on whatever it was that the district felt she was lacking. The answer was no, that it was a done deal. Ms. Feriano has always been the best, had the best interest of the children in mind when making decisions. If you take a look around Adams, you will see pictures of children who are proud to be part of the Adams team. These pictures were all taken by Ms. Feriano. She has gone beyond what her job description entails in many other ways. What I do not think is in her job description is to yes, answer yes sir or madam to policies she does not agree with. That is also being part of a great leader. There has been three principals in the last five years that have overseen Adams. To ask not only the teachers to go through the turmoil that it takes to have a new leader, but to take such a wonderful leader away from the children is a grave mistake. The message being sent to our children is that being a great leader is more seconds, please. about playing the game and not about being a leader. To my knowledge, Ms. Veriano has not been caught embezzling school funds or freebasing cocaine in the teacher's lounge. She has come to Adams and done what she was supposed to do, and that is to be a great leader. If the district wants a principal at Adams that is willing to play the game expected of them and to not be a true leader, then you do not have the best interest of our children in mind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Adams, followed by. Um, my name is Carol McKenzie. I've been a teacher at Adams for 13 years. My dad was a school principal for LA City Schools for 37 years. Um, to reassign Marge Veriano, um, in many of our opinion, was the wrong decision based on secret, questionable sources of which we know not uh, for questionable motives. Um, please collect more facts before carrying this out, um, please reevaluate this decision. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lisa Prezikop. Who did I forget? <sighs> okay. Hi, my name's Lisa Prezikop. I'm the Associate Director of Admissions at UC Santa Barbara parent of a senior at Dos Pueblos High School and I served on the school site council at Dos Pueblos. I'm here to talk about the possible reduction in the number of counselors in the district. I first want to start by saying I've been in this field for 26 years and I can absolutely say that the district counselors we have are about the best in the state. I've worked with counselors throughout California and our counselors are incredibly knowledgeable and strong advocates for our students. I'm always impressed by the fact that our counselors in our district advocate for all students, not just those that are clearly headed towards college, but those students who are the late bloomers, um, whether it be directing them to Santa Barbara City College for later transfer or just making sure they have the resources they need to be successful. They're very effective in guiding students through the A through G requirements and UC requirements, which I must confess are incredibly complex. I, I worry that uh, cutting the counseling staff size at the schools is really going to go against the board's own goal of increasing the number of students going to the University of California and the CSU system. I can tell you admission letters went out this, this week across the UC campuses and competition for admission was more fierce than it has ever been before. The information is highly complex and by, re by increasing the counselor caseload, it's going to make it much more difficult for them to effectively get that information across to your most needy students. So I'd really uh, encourage you not to reduce that. Also, I'd like to say as a parent, I have a student who went through some very serious medical conditions this last year, has missed a tremendous amount of school. He would not have been successful without his counselor, Mary Willer, at Dos Pueblos advocating for him. I don't know that counselors would have the time to do that with an increased load. And lastly, I just want to say my voicemail is full from all of the district counselors right now who are advocating for students at their school to get admitted to UC. And again, reducing that, you're going to, in essence, reduce the number of students you have in the UC system. So please reconsider. Thank you. Thank you.
Mar Mary Beth Adams, followed by uh, Ms. Headley, Had um, I call that, uh, followed by Sandra uh, Raheta. Mary Beth Adams. Mrs. Adams here? No. Okay. Mrs. Hadley. Thanks, members of the school board and uh, Dr. Sarvis and district staff. It's great to be here and to see all of you and to see all these wonderful parents and guidance counselors and everybody here. Just like to let you know, my name is Colette Hadley and I'm the executive director at the Scholarship Foundation of Santa Barbara. And We've been in this community for 46 years, and for all 46 years, we've worked with the Santa Barbara School District guidance staff. And um, I just want to piggyback on what Lisa said uh, about the fact that you really do have the finest guidance staff I think that you could have anywhere. Santa Barbara School District not only has fine teachers, but you would not have the students' success at college or, or vocational school or whatever their choices are after they leave if they did not have the fine services of this guidance staff. We have a great close relationship with them. We could not do our work giving away millions of dollars in scholarships if we didn't have a very close working relationship. Dr. Sarvis and all the principals advocate for that, but the guidance staff make it happen. We really could not do our work, and I have to tell you that we do have a lot of contact across the country with other scholarship organizations. And students cannot get to college without their help. And we are very fortunate here that we le at least have a minimal, minimal level of staffing. Reducing that, you really will have a dramatic effect, a dramatic effect on the number of students that will successfully go on from your high school, junior high and high schools, to post-secondary education. It's a very one-to-one -one correlation. There's not much different that can happen there. So we really encourage you to seconds. keep that as the staffing levels as high as you can. We couldn't do it without them. Beyond academic proficiency, I really think you want to ensure the well-being and success of your students. The guidance staff are crucial to that, not only for choosing classes and personal counseling, but for working with all the many nonprofits in the community that want to help the students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I do want to be clear that we had to close to public comment when we took the initial 20 speakers because that puts us at double the amount of time that we normally reserve for public comment. If there are others that want to make public comment, then you can write to us, you can email to us, or you can come to the next meeting. Thank you. So okay. go ahead, Mr. Uh, Sandra, followed by Gary Linker, followed by Octavio Cabrera, and uh, student Adrian Montiel. And can the, the two that follow Sandra uh, go over to that area, be ready to come up? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. But we, we can get a line going so that it's, it's more efficient. If the next speaker could go ahead and get stand next near the podi podium and the speaker after that as well. Good idea. All right, m my name is Sandra Daeta and I am a senior at San Marcos High School. Um, throughout my high school career, I've been very successful, but my successes would be almost impossible without the help of my counselors. For example, I am the first in my family to go to college. My parents weren't able to help me with that in that direction because they didn't know. And counselors, as well as my school, provided um, clubs like Royal University, which showed me step by step how to get there to university and showed me scholarships I would have never been aware of, such as Parent Night and all these wonderful workshops that I would have never known and answered my questions. And now I've recently been admitted to UC San Diego, which. <laughs> So it's no longer a distant dream, but it's, it's here. I'm really excited. I was also awarded a Goleta Teen of the Year 2008, and I wouldn't have been able to be nominated if my counselor wouldn't have nominated me. I, was also, I also studied abroad in Italy, and I wouldn't, that wouldn't have even been possible if my counselor wouldn't have sat down and gotten my schedule structure worked out so I would have been able to have enough credits to graduate from college. Now, I am just one example of these various ways that counselors can impact a student. I'm just one out of those 300 students that they support, that they uh, advise and staff. And these people aren't just counselors, but they're coaches. They're advisors for special seconds. clubs. And they are parents. And I am <laughs> amazed with everything they do. But they're not superheroes. They're not superheroes. And I don't think 
that by raising it to 500 or 600 students to one counselor will make the impact that it's making right now. I think every student has a fair shot for success if, it, if they have a good one-on-one -on -one relationship with their counselor. I'm not asking you for to add anything. I'm just asking you to keep our counseling funding. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Jolinko, Linker, followed by Octavio Cabrera, followed by Ruben Gill. Hi, um, my name is Dr. Gary Linker. I'm Dr. Gary Linker, I'm the Executive Director of the Counseling Center, and uh, we have a counseling uh, clinic uh, that we operate that uh, receive a lot of referrals from the schools. But we also have a program called the Youth Outreach Program in which we operate in five schools. We have 10 groups, over 60 kids a week uh, work, work and, and uh, work with us at the schools. And many of these are high risk kids. And um, I'm very concerned about the potential uh, cut in counseling because we really have a hand in glove relationship with the counselors at the schools. I'll provide an example that happened today. I'm leaving the office about five o'clock. I get a call from one of my counselors that one of the youngsters at Santa Barbara High School uh, talked about being suicidal today. And the first thing she did, of course, was to take that student to the counselor. And that counselor worked with that student. The grandmother was called and help was provided. We need to have this kind of safety net operating in our schools, especially now when we're seeing tremendous economic difficulties occurring. With more and more parents having to take extra jobs to get by, kids are having to raise themselves. The school counselor becomes the lifeline. They become the uh, advocate. They become the best friend. They become the uh, confidant to so many kids. Uh, I was a high school counselor myself in 1974 to 76. I've spent my career in education. I was the director and founder of, New, of, of Pacifica Graduate Institute. And so my long experience in education tells me that kids need a connection. They need someone who's there for them. And for too many kids, unfortunately, their teachers and their, and their counselors are, are that lifeline. So I urge you to be very, very serious in how you decide uh, to spend the resources that you have available to you. You have a very difficult job. I wouldn't want to be in your shoes. But I absolutely believe that counseling is a crucial element that we cannot afford to lose. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cabrera and uh, Mr. Montiel. Yes. Hola, buenas noches. Mi nombre es Edgar Adrián Montiel y soy estudiante de la Escuela San Marcos High School, grado 10. If you pause for a moment, we can have Spanish simultaneous translation. If you could hold a moment. Sorry, not simultaneous, but she'll, she'll, she'll repeat. Sequential. Hola, buenas noches. Good, good night. Uh, hi. Good night. I'm not going to go to school. Okay. Mi nombre es Edgar Adrián Montiel. His name is Edgar Adrián Montiel. Soy, el, soy estudiante de la Escuela San Marcos High School. And he's a student of San Marcos High School. Grado 10. And the 10th grade. La razón por la que estoy aquí the reason why is he, he is here es porque los recortes a consejeros because of the cuts in the counselors tendrán un efecto negativo will have an effect, neg a negative effect entre mis compañeros y yo. With the, uh, her, the, all the students. Personalmente, la ayuda que he recibido de mi consejero the help that he's received by, uh, uh, from counselors me ha ayudado a obtener las clases. It's been helping him to uh, take the classes. Y poder disfrutar más la escuela. And enjoy the school. Le pido a la mesa directiva. He's asking to the um, board of directors. Que reconsidere. To consider. Este, la pro el efecto que va a tener, el efecto que va a tener el recorte de consejeros. The effect of what's going to have the, the cut of the counselors. Entre mis compañeros y yo. With all the students. Gracias por su atención. Thanks for your attention.
Thank you. Mr. Cabrera. Uh, hello, hello, yes. and good evening, members of the board. My name is Octavio Cabrera. Probably some of you already know me. I'm a, I'm a parent of San Marcos High School in La Colina Junior High. I'm a elect representative for five years, and I hope I become a school site council member of San Marcos. And in my involvement, I, I find out the, the importance of counseling. I, I understand the, excuse me for my English. In my involvement, I have seen the important and benefits of good counselors. And I understand it's your responsibility to, to do good decisions for our, for our schools, for, for the benefit and education of our children. Please do not cut counselors. They are the guidance for our students, our children. And once again, And once again, please don't can don't cut counselors. They are the heart and soul for the education. And please, I ask you to reconsider. And thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Gill, followed by Ms. Lafferty, followed by uh, Ms. Mejia. Thank you. My name is Ruben Gill, and I'm currently a counselor at Santa Barbara Junior High School. Thank you. Thank you. I say currently because this may not be the case come next school year. We're asking you, our distinguished school board members, and you, Dr. Sarvis, as well, to keep our AB 1802 supplementary counselors in place for next school year. We're not asking for any extra money to keep 18, AB 1802 in place. We're not asking for preferential treatment over any other of the valuable programs in our district. We only ask that you continue to use the funds that the state has already designated for AB 1802 counselors. According to Eric Smith, Deputy Superintendent, the state provided our district $680,000 to fund AB 1802 counselors at all secondary schools. If all AB 1802 counselors are cut from the upcoming budget, we, ha we will have received the largest cut to any one program, elementary and secondary combined. I understand that we are in a fiscal crisis, but we also know that we are in a social crisis as well. Many students and their families can tell countless stories of how school counselors have supported their children academically, socially, and emotionally. Much of the work that I have been able to do as a counselor is because we, as counselors, have fewer students on our caseloads. Specifically, at Santa Barbara Junior High School, this has allowed me to make personal home visits to support at-risk students, create and participate in early intervention programs for all students, support our AVID program in student recruitment and placement by visiting our feeder schools, teaching curriculum in the AVID classroom and participate in AVID family nights, 20 seconds, connecting families with valuable community resources, and the list goes on. This is on top of my regular duties as a counselor. And I love my job as a counselor. Reducing the number of counselors will compromise our ability to serve our students well. Thanks again for your time. quiet so we can hear the next speaker. Dear Santa Barbara School Board members, my name is Jenny Lafferty and I'm the parent of a I'm the parent of a ninth grader at Dos Pueblos High School. My son came to Santa Barbara School District after 10 years at parochial school and we were lucky enough to have him placed at DP. In eighth grade my son was bored with school and his academics were suffering. He left eighth grade with a 2.4 GPA. We never doubted his abilities, but were seriously concerned about his motivation and academics. The first thing we did was contact DP counselor Corey Simpkins. Corey went way above and beyond in helping my family. She emailed me when I had so many questions before the school year began. 
Corey helped my son translate his parochial school classes into a manageable academic first year in high school. She immediately began recognizing him on campus and calling him by name. As the year progressed, he became interested in video production and DP news, all with Corey's support. In January, we met with Corey to arrange my son's academic roadmap through high school. And last night, he was inducted into the National Honor Society and California Scholarship Federation. <laughs> my son could not have made this kind of academic progress without Corey. I beg you to reconsider any cuts in counseling positions at any of the schools. I'm scared to think about how we would have made it through those rough first weeks without DP's entire counseling staff. If I had to, I would have paid for their services without thinking twice about it. Thank you. Um, before the next speaker starts, I do want to remind members of the public that the purpose of this is for the board to be able to hear these speakers. So if you're making noise out there and we can't hear you, then we'll have you leave the room. So please keep it quiet so that we have respect for the speakers. Thank you. Ms. Mejia. Wonderful. Thank you so much for allowing us to make comment today. Um, my name is Maritza Mejia. I work with the Scholarship Foundation of Santa Barbara, and I'm privileged enough to work with the counseling staffs at the different high schools and junior high schools. We know that you have a very difficult decision ahead of you, and I don't envy the position that you're in. But I'm here to remind you so much that the counselors are exactly what we need more of in order to really make positive progress, not just in our schools, but in our community as a whole. Students need counselors. They need someone that will be that consistent face throughout their four years that will help them with the whole picture of their lives, to help them with social problems, with academic crisis, with other types of crisis that would be impossible for them to deal with on their own. I often get personal calls from counselors who go above and beyond the call of duty to help their students, to help them access financial aid, to help them get on a path to college. And without that personal phone call, I just don't know how we would ev ever be able to help these students, how these students would ever be able to get connected to resources in the community that can help them. When I'm in the schools, the counselors have open arms. They're always looking for ways to help the parents in their community, to help the students, to help them in any way that they can. And I just am in awe of how much they have to juggle, how much they already have to hold, all the balls that they have to keep going in the air, how many of these responsibilities are truly vital to the well-being of their students. I just wanted to uh, remind you of some of the students that I know I've seen, even just this in the past couple of months, that have been caught About by counselors seconds. from slipping through the cracks. And I just don't know what would have happened without the, the vital role of these counselors. The counselors who have provided valuable educational workshops for students and parents who have no other means to get a hold of information. The students who I've seen who have little support from their families um, due to abuse or other crises that are happening at home. The underrepresented students who have never even thought that college was in their reach who have now all of a sudden seen a brighter light ahead of them. I ask you to keep these in sight and ask you to think about how we would ever be able to fill this gap. And truly, I don't think we can without the counselors. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Bakewell, followed by uh, Marciela De La Rosa, followed by Nancy Macias. Hi. Um, my name is Mac Bakewell. I'm here as a, a currently a parent of a 10th grade student at DP, I'm also the parent of a 38-year-old who uh, graduated from Santa Barbara High a number of years ago. Um, she also went to, the 38-year-old went to La Cumbre School, and uh, she came, moved here from Australia the first day at school. You can imagine how strange it all was. We met a man named uh, Don Skipworth, who was counselor at La Cumbre then. Um, Don and I are still good friends. Um, I really think that uh, if, you, if you look at the, the private public high schools, the typical counselor to, they call them advisors and advisees normally, uh, the ratio is something like 1 to 10. Here, the current ratio is 1 to 250 or 1 to 300, and you're talking about making that worse? That's, uh, I really, really think that uh, it was the best line I've heard so far tonight is that counselors are the heart and soul of the school, and it's not the place to cut. So thank you. Thank you. Yo soy madre de una de 
Soy Marisela de la Rosa, mi hija está en la... Wait just a moment. She has okay. her own translator, I believe. Do you? Oh, okay. No? Oh, no. All right. Mi nombre es Marisela de la Rosa. Mi nombre es Marisela de la Rosa. Mi hija está en la Junior High de Santa Bárbara. Uh, her daughter attends Santa Bárbara Junior High. El cambio de la primaria a la secundaria es un cambio para los niños muy fuerte. She thinks that the change between the elementary school to the junior high is a strong change. Hay muchos problemas en la Junior High. She said that is, there's a lot of problems in the junior high. Entre los alumnos, entre los niños. Between the students. Y los consejeros, el consejero de la escuela, Rubén and Gil, ha ayudado uh, mucho a mi hija y a muchos alumnos, muchos compañeros de mi, de, de mi hija a salir de los problemas, and a salir fuera de las drogas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, what's the conclusion? Is here? Okay, um, He's, she's mentioning uh, the counselor, Mr. Hill, how he's been helping uh, her daughter and other students with um, difficulties that they have. Sobre las drogas, regarding a, drugs, a, a no meterse con las gangas, a ubicarse no más en, en sus estudios. And focus on um, their um, studies. En lo personal, y yo creo que entre todos los padres, sí nos gustaría que reconsideren, que no hagan recortes de consejeros. Um, She wants the board to con reconsider that not to do any cuts because the counselors help them so much. Porque son de mucha ayuda. Ellos impulsan, ayudan mucho a los niños. Los niños necesitan alguien que les they aconseje. They help the students a lot and they need someone who can advise them. Es todo. That's it. Thank you very no much. No recorten consejero. Ms. Macias, followed by Sandy Shrove. Okay, well, I am here to talk about Mr. Gill. Um, I have known Mr. Gill my whole life. He is a great person, and anyone who knows him will say the same thing about him. We don't want him to leave Santa Barbara Junior High School because he is a person who has always helped us in everything we need. Whenever we needed something from him, he would always be there for us. He would even give up his lunch time or his family time just to help us in any problem, problem we had and comfort us in any way. We were his main priority. All of us students trust him and have major respect for him. Right now, I am attending Santa Barbara High School, but I know that whenever I have a problem or just simply need someone to talk to, I know Mr. Gill will be there for me. He taught, a lot of, he taught a lot of us students what the real meaning of education was. He was basically our second dad at school. He would guide us through the right steps. He would help us fix our mistakes. And also, most, most of us, if not all of us, have younger siblings who will be attending Santa Barbara Junior High School soon, and we would really like it if Mr. Gill is still working at the junior high school. Um, I know that, it, that if he... I know that he's going to help them the same way he helped all of us. I want my sister to have an adult at school who she can trust and view as a great role model. I know that there's other adults at school, but I just can't describe all the great things Mr. Gill means to me. I know, I know he will care for them just like he cared for us. He has helped many students out and a lot of the community, a lot of the community knows him because of his great heart and personality. Mr. Gill really enjoys working at the junior high school and with the community. I know this because he, ha he has told many of us the same thing. Um, I hope you take all this under consideration and let him keep his job at the junior high. Because if you don't, just imagine all the hearts he would be breaking. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Mrs. Shrove. Words matter. In his essay, Politics and the English Language, George Orwell reminds us that if thought corrupts language, language can also corrupt thought. We're all familiar with euphemism, political spin, shades of meaning, literary devices used to equivocate rather than educate, to incite rather than inform. At last week's EPAC meeting, I heard Deputy Superintendent Eric Smith explain the district budget, and I want to thank him for his patience. I learned a great deal, including that I'm not qualified to do what he does. I also learned that vocabulary used in the budget is somewhat inconsistent and perhaps not accidentally so. 
When the district's gate programs overspend their revenue and rely on the general fund to bring them into the black, it's called a general fund contribution. Contribute, of course, means to give or provide jointly with others to have a share in bringing about to be responsible for. <laughs> However, when the district's special ed programs overspend their revenue and rely on the general fund to bring them into the black, it's called a general fund encroachment. Encroach means to trespass or intrude, especially in a gradual or sneaking way, to advance beyond the proper, original, or customary limits. In other words, the GATE program is jointly supported out of a sense of shared responsibility on the part of the district, while the special ed department forgets its proper place and comes sneaking around, trespassing, taking that which rightly belongs to someone else. I asked Mr. Smith about the difference in terminology and he candidly admitted it was one of semantics. Semantics, as we all know, refers to the relationships between signs and symbols, in this case words, and the concepts, feelings, etc., associated with them in the minds of their interpreters. Semantics understands that words matter. Now I realize that accounting labels are standard practice. However, when you describe two virtually identical processes with different terms, Ten one seconds. benevolent and one pejorative, you engage in political spin whether you intend it or not. And if this district is serious about curing the many ills in its special ed department and wants to create a culture of trust, inclusion, acceptance, perhaps it might begin with its budget terminology. Thank you very because much. Because words matter. matter. Thank you, Mrs. Shove, and that is, um, oh yes, Mr. Hearn. First, I'd, I'd like to just say thank you to everybody. Uh, number one, you were concise, you had it prepared. This is not easy getting up there and talking to us. So those of you who, you know, fear it, you did a fantastic job. I also appreciate all the emails. Uh, it's an education process, and uh, I appreciate the thought that goes into that and the fact that you communicate. So I, I just want to thank everybody for what they did tonight and coming here and letting us know how you feel. Thank you. Dr. Noel. I wanted to ask if the superintendent had any uh, explanatory comments or some context because to some people watching this is like off the wall. Uh, yeah, in fact, uh, I tried to do some introduction to it in the superintendent's report, but uh, but for other members of the public, it's important to know that the board has identified $3 million in budget cuts uh, that need to be made. The board will be looking at uh, potential lists. Some of them are provided just by the state's inclusion uh, as tier one or, or tier three priorities that, uh, that allow districts flexibility. Uh, there are a number of other things that are provided by the state. Others are provided by by ideas from staff, from stakeholders, and parents uh, about ways that we can uh, enhance revenue and, and cut expenses. Uh, but we do need to reach that $3 million. We will be meeting to have a major discussion of this at our next board meeting on April 14. And then we expect to make those final decisions at the final board meeting in April, April 28. Thank you. All right. Dr. Noel. Uh, Part, part of, uh, of my question, Dr. Sarvis, is that on numerous occasions I've uh, advocated for the concept of zero-based budgeting. Uh, Dr. Noel, well, I'm going to stop you there because I, I, wanna I be wanted really to careful. ask him if he, if, if he is going, when he comes back, if he is going to be putting these cuts in the context of a broader set of evaluation of priorities and possible cuts, which is what, which is what happens when you do zero-based budgeting. Yes, that I, is a question, Madam President. Um, yes, but I want to be clear that this is actually public comment that we're on right now. Pardon me? Um, this is public comment, and so it should be in direct well, relationship I thought, to I that. I thought when we went to that Brown Act meeting, we were told that a board member could ask a question at any time. You can ask a brief question. I, yeah, I thought that was okay. pretty brief. I haven't heard an answer yet. Well, and I'd be happy to give you an but answer. But we're not going to do that now. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, C4, acceptance of donations. Well, what's the point of, question, of having a right to question if there's no answer? Um, you get an answer either at a next board meeting when it gets put onto an agenda or you can get that in a staff uh, report, but you're not going to get a, an in-depth uh, answer at this point because you know that's a very complicated topic, Dr. Noel. 
So let's move on to C4, acceptance I, of I donations. I asked it in such a way that, that a yes or no answer would have done fine. Has he prepared something like a zero-based menu for us to look at? Move to Very approve simple. with appreciation. Is there a second? We're on C4, acceptance of donations. Nobody wants to accept our donations. <laughs> Second. I'll I'll second. All right. Moved by Cordero, seconded by Heron. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. It passes unanimously. And then we're on to uh, item D, the consent agenda. Any items to pull, please? D13. D13. Any other items to pull? Is there a motion? Move to approve the remainder of the consent agenda. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. It passes unanimously. Uh, Dr. Noel has left the room, so that's a 4 0 vote. Yes, I just didn't turn it on. All right. Now we're on to item E1, approval of measure I-2008, Parcel Tax Citizens Oversight Committee, parent candidate. Well, when we appointed the Parcel Tax Citizens Committee members, uh, we did not have a, a parent member on the elementary, the I-2008 uh, Parcel Tax Citizens Oversight Committee. We opened that position, went back to advertise, solicit names for that position. Uh, board members, you have the, the names of uh, people who responded to that, and we're asking that you make a selection so that we have a parent representative on that committee. Board members? Um, I, I'll start. I, um, we did have the, uh, the resume and application forms for each of these, and, and they all sound very qualified. I, um, I thought Kathleen Rogers had a nice combination of uh, music background. She's a parent of a kindergarten at Santa Barbara Community Academy, but she also has a background in, in marketing and public relations, which might be a nice component for this committee. So um, that stood out in my mind. And Mr. Heron. I'll second that. All right. The one thing I want to point out with this is that this is a, a female loaded committee. So I don't know if, if there are any concerns about that. But um, if not, if you'd like to make a motion. I would. I'd like to go ahead and move that um, we accept Kathleen Rogers as the parent representative on the Measure I Parcel Tax Committee. Is there a second? I'll second it. Any further discussion? Mrs. Cordero? Well, I am a little bit concerned about gender balance and gender inequity. Um, and I'm, I don't know any of these candidates or r really it's who they are, so um, it's difficult to make an assessment based on just, you know, what we see on paper. But I thought that Brian Robinson had a, also had a very interesting combination of information and uh, represents the Harding School community, which I thought would be also a a very appropriate community community to have represented on the board um, on the parcel tax committee. Um, so I, I really wasn't feeling like I had a strong preference in any direction, but I am partial to making sure that we have gender balance. Right. Um, I'm going to chime in that I I am concerned about gender balance also. Um, I think that the three great candidates, I, I want to say that the reason that I'm not bringing up the third candidate is that that, that is a Peabody Charter parent. While Peabody Charter is getting I-2008 money and it will be subject to the Citizens Oversight Committee to a certain extent, it's not participating in the district program. And so it will, it will be doing sort of its own thing within the guidelines of the parcel tax. And so um, I, I just think it would be better if it was somebody from uh, the the majority community. Um, I think that they're both great candidates. Um, uh, and my hope is that whoever serves, again, ag these are one or two year positions, um, so that the next person would then just come on as soon as 
um, uh, a, a position opened up. We do have a motion on the floor, so I'll go ahead and take a vote on that one. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? No. All right, um, so that's a, uh, let's see if we can get another motion out there. Well, I would move to approve Brian Robinson to be the parent representative on the Measure I Parcel Tax Oversight Committee. Is there a second? I'll second. All right. Um, all those in favor? Or any further discussion, let's say? Um, and I would just like to say that I know I made the point about gender equity when we were originally formulating these committees, and so it, it's only right that I think <laughs> that, that I follow my own rules here. So um, that's, and, and it certainly sounds like Mr. Robinson would do a, a very good job. Yeah. I, want, I didn't think of gender, I just thought of qualifications. Yeah. But I'm perfectly happy with Mr. Anderson. Okay. Robinson. Robinson, all right. Uh, there's a motion on the floor, so all those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, any opposed? Um, so that passes 4-0 with Dr. Noel abstaining, um, although he has now um, come back to the meeting. Um, we now move on to item E2, approval of Santa Barbara School District's safe school plans. And Michael Gonzalez, our director of, uh, of student services, will make this presentation. Good evening. Um, the education code requires that on an annual basis, schools uh, and more specifically, it authorizes the school site councils or a committee of the school site council to annually review their school safety plans by March 1st. There's also a requirement by the Education Code that these plans be presented to the board for your approval, and that's the spirit in which we present these documents to you tonight. The uh, actual uh, administration of the school safety program is in the hands of our Officer of Safety, Attendance and Welfare, Mr. Bud Andrews, and we're prepared to answer any questions you might have. Board members. Dr. Noel. Yes, uh, I, I'm impressed uh, by the volume of this. I've only, this stack is only the uh, secondary district. As you know, it's a lot of material. Uh, but I'm also impressed by how little information there is uh, in some areas in, in this material. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I also am very impressed with the schools that included the costs of vandalism. That's the first time I've seen that in a, in a school safety report, and I thought that was very helpful. Uh, I wonder why, why it is we can't have more uniformity in these documents. Uh, that All the schools didn't do that. Uh, some one school included Healthy Kids survey data from the last year in which uh, this district administered that program, that's 2006, and no other schools did. Uh, I have a question is, uh, did, w was it administered in 2008, fall 2008 would have been the next time, so every two years I believe. Uh, are we not required to, to administer that uh, survey? in order to get uh, Tupé funds and some other categorical funds. I thought those programs required it. And, uh, and I would think that, that if we did it, we would have had it in here if, if those data would be available. Uh, those, are, those are my main concerns, uh, particularly the Healthy Kids Survey. Uh, let, let, let me go back to your first question, in a, and I'll make a general comment, and then I'll turn it over to Mr. Andrews. He, you actually are seeing skeletons of the full document. Uh, as I've shared with the board before, there is information that we will not include in those safety plans out of concerns for confidentiality for students and staff. And also, there are safety concerns. There are some information internal to the planning of a s particular school that we do not want to make available to the general public. So these are not the full documents. Board members, of course, have access to the full documents, and they will be housed right behind that screen. 
in those documents you will find everything, for example, like student schedules, the uh, exit routes, emergency routes, uh, uh, medical confidential health records, also uh, the same information uh, not only for students but also for staff. This information by law cannot be released, be released to the public. Uh, the more specific questions that Dr. Noel has brought up, I'll ask Mr. Andrews to answer. Yes, sir, on the uh, California Healthy Kids Survey, we did do that in November. There's a, but this safe school plan was, the deadline to complete it was March 1st. We didn't actually get those results for the, the Healthy Kids Survey until, I want to say the second or fourth, second, to the 4th of March, somewhere around that time frame. We only have the district-wide, I haven't yet received the school-specific Healthy Kids Survey stuff from, uh, from the State Department, but I just asked literally today, and they can get that to me within the next two weeks. Yeah, I think uh, I, I would certainly like to see Healthy Kids Survey data. Uh, I'm looking through for, for one other thing that, uh, it, ah, it's in the, uh, Goleta Valley uh, Junior High uh, write up. Where'd he go? <laughs> Just grabbing it, sir. <laughs> Take your eyes off the rostrum for a minute and they <laughs> disappear. <laughs> All right, sir. Uh, this is uh, on page, well, it's not page 20, it's like page 4. It's the. It's, I believe, done by the staff. And the staff asks answers, it's the committee, at least the last time uh, that I looked at these, it, this was filled out by the safety committee at Santa Barbara High School in, the, in that particular instance uh, at each school. And it's, it includes the staff's opinion of where they are, and I, I'm having a hard time, it says, uh, that are, are their plans checked, they have boxes to check, highly developed, partially developed, not developed, uh, a level of pri and then a level of priority assigned. Now this doesn't. This only appears in Goleta Valleys, and it's not filled out. <laughs> and and I found that exceptionally useful information because it's really representatives of the faculty telling us how they feel about a, a, a my goodness a, at least 20 30 items, uh, sort of like the Healthy Kids Survey, but this is the Healthy Faculty Survey, uh, the Healthy you. Campus Survey. That goes to one of your questions on the uniformity of the safe school plan. Is that I'm currently working with each one of the schools, especially the elementaries that don't have the same administrative support as the secondaries, to get the same process and the same content in each one of these reports. Uh, specifically, why Goleta Valley doesn't have answers written in there, I don't know. Well, but they did better than the other schools. The other school didn't even include the form. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. okay. And so at least we know that that form exists. I, I, I think that's a, I think those two pieces of information, aside from legal requirements on the Healthy Kids Survey, uh, uh, th that's vital information for the board and for the public to understand uh, how, in the eyes of students, issues having to do with safety and, uh, and welfare are perceived, and in the eyes of the faculty. There's a, I can assure you then in the next report that will be part of it. But can we move toward having that uh, uniform? Yes, sir. It's already in process. Okay. Thank you very much. Mrs. Deacon. Um, well, I'll, I'll piggyback on that. As, as uh, Mr. Andrews and Mr. Gonzalez know, I also raised this issue with them about the uniformity and the possibility of having templates um, that each school uses so that we can compare apples to apples. And I, I note from your memo that you're already moving forward on doing that, so I appreciate that. And I think that's going to be really helpful. Um, I, I also would like to um, just reinforce my point about the importance of institutionalizing student feedback across the board, at least in the junior highs and high schools. And I know that some schools certainly did that. We have a very nice um, survey here from La Cumbre. It, it was done in 2007, but um, the students responded. And, and there's a lot of meaningful data in there that I think that we can act upon. And so I would really like to see us be sure to incorporate student responses as well um, when it's appropriate. So I appreciate that. And I have a few more things, but I'll let some other board members speak as well. Mrs. Cordero. 
Well, I don't have a lot more to add. Um, the uniformity, I think, was probably, I'm guessing that was probably something all of us um, were concerned about because uh, reading through those, it was, it, it, it was difficult enough because we had so many, and then it was made more difficult by the fact that they were so varied, um, and it was hard to find the same kind of information th throughout. Um, so I think that's m you know one of my big concerns. An another concern that's really on the other end of the spectrum is just in our efforts to try to be as green as possible in our district, I found that having the single site plans included in some of them was really unnecessary and a tremendous addition of paper um, that we already had and that already are available at the, w first of all, we personally all have them already as I must, and they're also available readily at the site, at the uh, district office if we wanted to review them and didn't have our copy. So what I was going to suggest is that we maybe, uh, your office, maybe with Mr. Gonzalez's office, I'm not sure who would be involved, bring us maybe back just a, a checklist or something of what you think would be included in a sort of a standardized template so that we can either, you know, add, say yes, we think, you know, we need those or no, we want to delete that, but we think we need something else instead um, before we do this again next year because I thought most of them had information that was quite useful, but there was some information that I would have liked to have seen okay. more consistently. We will be more than happy to uh, bring you a checklist. Please know that the education code spells out about I believe about 17 different items that are required by law. However, uh, the district, the board, has the ability to prescribe additional items that they would like uh, to be included in those documents. Is, is the single site plan one of the items that's required? No, it is not. Okay. Uh, let me add one more thing. The, uh, in years past, uh, there was more uniformity in these documents than currently exist because the state actually produced a template. The state got rid of the, stem of the template and uh, left the, uh, the 17 requirements embedded but provided districts no template. And so we have had to organize uh, and instruct the schools on a more uniform uh, report and I think next year you'll see the culmination of that work. Mr. Herring. Yeah, two or three things. Um, I agree with uniformity. Um, are the schools given a bulk of material that, that they use and then fill in? Because I saw so much uniformity in policies and it surprised me how old our policies are. So I'm hoping we're working on that because most of them were 1999, which sort of interested me. Um, even the school uh, dress code is the 1999 5132. It's not the new dress code that was established, but every one of them had the old one. So that, that sort of surprised me. I thought maybe somebody would have said, hey, <laughs> maybe there's a newer dress code. Um, but speaking of dress codes, the uh, Santa Marcos High School dress code has the gang-related dress code attached to it. And my question is, by approving this, are we approving that dress code, or is that dress code still coming to the board for approval? That board, uh, that uh, proposal uh, from San Marcos High School will be on the agenda of the next board meeting. And uh, I would urge you, uh, as you approve the document, to exclude that plan. You may recall that the board asked for a separate process. The school has put together their petition and it will be sent, uh, will be presented to the board at the next board meeting. That was my question, so thank you. And then the final, I, I bet I really, Mr. Andrews, I really appreciate the fact that you answered my questions in your memo because that it interested me what our obligation was and you spelled it out really nicely. Uh, I would like to compliment, um, you know, but let me just say, there were several that I thought were extremely good. There were some, some I thought phoned it in, uh, especially those that have the, the 1990 or uh, 2006, you know, roster of administrators. 
you know, again, I would have hoped somebody would say, hey, this is two years old. Shouldn't we get a new roster to put in here? It, so it, some called it in, which I, I, you know, my whole career is that if I put my name on a document, that's my signature. That's my reputation. Somehow I, I think that's missing in some of these. But I did like Cleveland because one of my questions to you would, was what does student resiliency mean? And uh, Cleveland answered that. So I appreciate Cleveland for answering it. Thank you. Um, I want to chime in here and say that um, I, I think that these, that you've actually made progress this year from last year in terms of uniformity, although there's still definitely a ways to go. But I, I do see progress, so thank you for that. I wanted to talk about uh, La Cuesta, uh, the, the, the new safety plan here for their new site down here, with district office considerations. And I really appreciated seeing those district office considerations because that's the first time that I have seen that. Um, so it's it's great to see that you have a plan in place for what personnel in, in this side of the building will be doing in case of an emergency. Um, one thing that concerns me is how district office employees or employees that are based at the district office, for example, maintenance workers, um, or any one of you actually, um, how you are trained uh, to behave when you are on a site that's in the middle of an emergency. And I know that there have been issues, for example, um, at, at, uh, I, I've heard of one particular case at a high school where they were having a lockdown drill, but there were painters in one room, and the kids are taught you go into the, the next room that has uh, you know, an unlocked door and get yourself in there. Well, the painters promptly kicked them out. Fortunately, that was a drill, but if there had actually been an emergency on campus, so it would have been a crisis. So I'm hoping that you will um, be training uh, or you have something in place or are thinking of putting something in place that will train those of you that go out to visit school sites how to behave when there's, a, when there's an emergency on those campuses. Um, and Mrs. Deacon? I, I'm sorry, I just want to say one more thing. Um, in an effort to be green, I, I also was overwhelmed by the amount of paper and I know you probably heard that from, from multiple board members. My thought was perhaps we could keep master copies at the district office and that board members could just go in and spend, say, an hour, two hours, how long, however long it took to review them, which I think would save a lot of staff time not as, as well as paper. And so that's just an alternate idea I'd like to throw out as something I, I would I certainly be happy I noted it from our previous with. conversation. And I personally think that's a terrific idea. I don't know if other board members have any objections to it. No, but I love the paper. <laughs> you want that <laughs> and, big and carton to come to your door. That there's <laughs> even more to read over yeah, there. Is exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so right. maybe we could opt to, to either get them ourselves or come down and read them at the district I, office. I, I guess, although I imagine most of us would probably want to come down here. Or Mr. check Mr. them out and mm -hmm. take them home and read them. Yes, it could be a library service. Uh, before we take any action on this, um, oh, Dr. Noel? Yeah, if you don't mind. Uh, the, that vandalism data was, was really interesting. And, and uh, uh, I wouldn't mind, have, uh, as another agenda item, having uh, uh, that something that we could talk about and, and get input from other schools. It clearly, mm -hmm. there's enormous variability between the schools based on what we've seen. Uh, it would be nice to hear a, a report on that and, and uh, it looks like it'd be almost cost effective if, if, if to, to spend some money on more security. I'm not sure what mm -hmm. the trade-offs are there, but I'd love mm -hmm. to have a conversation on that. Okay. Uh, I think we have public comment on this, Mr. Hearn. Mr. Wheeler. I'm, I'm working on my brow because my last photo up was Last rep council determined that I either needed to plant corn up there or have Botox, and, and it was about 50-50 on, on how that should go. So I'm working on that. Thank you, Elaine Wheeler, Santa Barbara Teacher Association. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Andrews for uh, the beginning that he made on a very essential part of our, our school day. It, it doesn't fall into the three R's, certainly, but it just certainly falls into the safety issue, which every educator and every certificated staff member is charged with as part of their responsibilities. Um, this is a beginning, but it's only a beginning. And um, in terms of the construction of these projects, I know the principals and or vice principals at the secondary take a, a large part of the load on. And there are, is a certificated staff member signing off on this. But I'm really concerned that these plans get articulated down to the grassroots level to each of the members of the staff that are there. Because in the event of an emergency, as we all know, 
the first line uh, support people will be the teachers, the nurses, the uh, speech pathologists, the psychologists at the site, whether it be in a support service or actually managing those students. And for us to ex expect a written plan to be the document that's going to direct folks how to work is completely foolhardy. And I would encourage uh, the next portion of this implementation to be some training that accompanies this so that people, the staff members really know what to do in the event. Do I stick my head out and create a target for a shooter on campus to lock my door so that I keep my kids safe or do I pull down the curtains and know the next step to go? So we've heard this many, many, many times and this happens not only uh, in terms of more catastrophic events but on day-to-day -day events. Um, in this last week when we had March 13th and uh, we asked our community to wear pink and stand up for schools, I, for three days in a row, was delivering bagels out to our site to thank the certificated staff for the great job they did. And I certainly uh, had a chance to observe what Mr. Noel has cited on a number of times, that each of our campuses have very unique entry and exit points and they're very porous and <laughs> there's certainly a lots of ways to get in and get out of campuses. So uh, not that that's you know, a, a, a significant piece of this, but it certainly speaks to the issue that we need to be vigilant in our effort here. And uh, like I say, to have a plan is a great place to start, but to implement that plan and make that an essential piece, to actually embed that in people's consciousness, it has to be the piece that happens here. So the training piece needs to be part. Yeah. Exceeded my time? Oh, okay. Well, I'm sure I have about 30 seconds left, so I'll give myself my own 30-second warning. Um, one of the pieces that you heard earlier tonight, I'll just resonate for you because I'm sure you've heard it enough tonight, but when we have crisis in our school, when we have students in crisis, and we have our own staff members in crisis, the counselors are the first line of defense, mm -hmm. and I would encourage you to remember that as you move forward in your budget, uh, budget work. Thank you. Okay. Um, now, it sounds like we're being asked to pass all of the safety plans, to approve all of the safety plans. Can we approve San Marcos's minus the dress code? Um, so is there a motion to do that? Are we approving them or are we accepting them? We are approving the Santa Barbara School District safe school plans for all of our schools except for the, uh, s the gang apparel portion of the San Marcos safety plan. Okay, I move that we approve all of the safety plans for the safe, all of the safe school plans for our, for the schools in our district with the exception of the dress code for San Marcos. I'll second it. Any further discussion? Um, I just want to say I'm looking forward to next year's plans um, incorporating some of our recommendations. So am I. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 It passes unanimously. Item E3, the second reading and approval of tentative agreement language between the Santa Barbara School Districts and the Santa Barbara Teachers Association. Dr. Robertson, our Director of Personnel, will make this presentation. Thank you very much. Reasons to do a first and second reading is to allow the community time to look at a proposal and um, give them an opportunity for public comment. The first reading of the tentative agreement took place at the Tuesday, March 10th board meeting. Tonight, for the second reading, the Santa Barbara School Districts and Santa Barbara Teachers Association have negotiated new language and the tentative agreements that you have attached, and I'll go over those for the public, uh, reflect changes in the following areas. Under Article 6, we uh, dealt with hours and conditions and we um, negotiated language for instructional planning time, establishing instructional minutes for La Cuesta, uh, continuation school and the community day school programs and job sharing time frame. We also negotiated language on the three-year agreement and openers and exhibit C was co-curricular uh, activities a request to increase the junior and senior high choral stipend. Uh, there are um, the fiscal impact of this would be uh, an annual increase of six thousand nine dollars for the stipends and if you don't have any further questions I'd like to recommend that the board uh, approve the tentative agreements between Santa Barbara School Districts and the Santa Barbara Teachers Association. Are there any questions? Are there any speakers Mo on this item? All right. Move to approve. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 It passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. 
Next, it's item E4, approval of classified general fund and categorical positions, reductions, and layoffs due to lack of funds or lack of work. And Elaine Alvarado, our classified personnel coordinator, will make this presentation. Good evening, um, board members, Dr. Sarvis. Uh, do you want to review tonight's agenda item? And, and uh, most importantly, I wanted to review the process that we go through for classified layoffs. It is very different from certificated. Timelines are different, notifications are a little bit different. Um, I do um, want to acknowledge uh, that there is an editing error on the chart that we have in front of you. Um, although it does not affect the amount or the monetary part of the um, reduction, I added, I forgot to edit out uh, another Lacumbra school health assistant reduction. There was only one school health assistant at Lacumbra, but again, it does not impact the number that you see in front of you. <coughs> On the education code, it's uh, 45117, does indicate and that advise us that districts must provide notice to their classified employees either for two things, lack of work or lack of funds. Um, and this is projecting for the next school year. Um, so tonight's recommendation include a reduction of hours in the general fund classified positions, but primarily the, what we're going to look at tonight are the layoffs as a result of reduced categorical funding. A categorical funding, this is again not general fund monies, um, Title I, Title III, EIA, LA, um, LEP. We're also including the ACEs, Healthy Start um, positions, and even one, some from the bond monies. So we're looking at both federal and state fundings, and these are what we're anticipating are reductions. Um, Eric Smith, in fact, has um, provided ongoing communication with the principals that this funding will be reduced as much as 50% in the next year. So this year is, while it's routine for us to go through a process like this, this is a, a, an annual notification, soft monies, we never know what we're gonna do year to year on those um, certain positions. Unfortunately and, pre and, and predictably what's happening with the state and, and federal is that we are gonna look a little bit deeper and we're going to go a little bit more on our projections and our recommendations. Now, in years past, we go forward and we bring forth these recommendations. There's always the opportunity to rescind these re reductions or the layoffs once we have a better idea about the funding, um, when the state budget may revise, and, and as we get closer to our actual budget. Again, there's a lot of unknowns this year. Uh, the election is also... Um, critical in the timing of all this. So we are looking, um, again, as pr uh, recommendations and th the worst case, what we could, um, based on the predicted funding and the reduction that, that Mr. Smith has, has um, calculated. So um, again, we're, we're looking a little bit deeper this year, and I do have to say that we're going a little bit further back in um, some of the classified employees that have been here a little bit longer. We're talking about positions that are as you see in front of you, three-hour-a-day positions, instructional assistance to, to some full-time clerical positions. Um, the education code and, uh, mandates that we provide notification by April 29th, and that's just the, the, the way it, it reads. Now, what we've done this year, given the fiscal um, crisis that we're going through and the unpredictability, We've just jumped that up a little bit more because we feel we need to have a little bit more notification. Uh, we need to make be thorough in our decision and on our recommendation. And also, just the other uh, point is that school is ending a lot sooner this year, early June. So we want to make sure that we capture those employees who may be leaving uh, on June 4th and that we give them their proper 45-day notice. So the process started a lot earlier this year. The principals provided it me with their recommendations at the end of February, and that's what I'm bringing to you tonight. Um, we've notified the district has worked with CSEA, and we've discussed in negotiations the layoffs and, the, and have given them the affected employees. We also provide them with the, the CSEA with the uh, seniority list, and which is a very important part of this process. Um, one, following the board's approval, employees will be notified formally, and uh, we will start the process of what it looks like. One of the things I also wanted to explain to, the, to you as the, and the, uh, new board members, when we look at the uh, seniority list, we also look and consider um, bumping opportunities. For those that have some seniority, we'll be able to bump into positions based on their, their longevity. 
So some may be able to go into other positions. There are others that don't have sufficient seniority um, to bump into another position. So then those look at uh, uh, like true layoffs. Um, and they do retain um, eligibility to be rehired in the district for a 39 month period. The reduction of hours are a little bit different. This is when we're looking at from eight hours to seven hours or the six hours to an, and run further down or an hour. Um, those are subject to negotiations. Uh, we will be meeting on Friday, this Friday, to further dis discuss the reductions and other layoff um, um, protocols that we want to follow. Typically with reduction of hours, what we're looking at is, is the work that may not be covered or performed by other bargaining unit members. That could include hourlies and it could include volunteers. It just is dependent on the positions and then we have to, again, we will monitor that closely as we go through the process. So again, I just wanted to give you that general review. Um, again, you have in front of you the categorical recommendations that are coming from the site. Some of these may, again, be um, rescinded. Some may not be, and predictably, in this year's situation, probably a lot more than not. So if you have any questions or if you need some clarification, I certainly will be more than happy to go over that with you. Mrs. Cordero? Well, I had a question in, um, I, I, it, your, your comment just now kind of reinforced my question, which mm -hmm. is, you, uh, when I read this, it says subject to um, negotiation. The reduction of hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when we approve this, we're approving it um, for ratification by CSEA, is that? No, they so, or just approval by no. CCA. We what we're doing as far as moving forward on the recommendations, and then we d we negotiate the the impact of that, and what does that mean, and how who does the work, or how does the work go away, who will you know how we will for foresee what other components of that assignment. So it's it's really uh, we don't ne negotiate that component or it doesn't go away, but we go forward with the recommendation for the reduction of hours, but it, what we narrow it down to is the impact. So as an example, a clerical position, if we're reducing that by an hour, that hour of work has gone away. And it does, it is not picked up by another bargaining unit member or not, it, someone else doesn't fill that role. Typically, and I'm, I'm just generalizing tonight, um, we'll know more about it when we meet with CSEA. Okay, so the idea is that we cannot reassign those duties. Correct. Okay, okay, thank you. Any other questions? Mrs. Mrs. Deacon? Um, well, first of all, Ms. Alvarado, I'd just like to thank you for your thoughtful presentation. It, it helps to kind of walk through it so mm -hmm. we understand it better, especially for those of us who are new. Um, also, as someone new, I've been spending more time at the school sites than I ever had before, mm -hmm. and so it's, it's especially difficult when you start putting names and faces sure. to some of these positions. Mm -hmm. We were all at a parent project graduation the other night and now I see Linda Guerrero's position at DP is potentially mm -hmm. going to be Correct. eliminated and and we know there's some just terrific people out there doing these jobs and I understand it's, it's not easy for you either but I I'm hoping that we'll be able to to work through this in Certainly, a fair process yeah. and and that is our goal I mean uh, we will be monitoring that and as we get closer and through um, Mr. Smith and, and what we foresee on those categoricals it is um, you know, certainly we want to look at every uh, position that we could possibly retain. And um, uh, I would say probably mission critical using that, that terminology, um, for particularly that it is a position that we would want to look at. Any other board member comments? Uh, Dr. Oh, Noel? Uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, I, may, I have a number of little questions like. Okay. Uh, Intervention Center Coordinator at Santa Barbara Junior High School. Mm -hmm. Could you explain what that position is? This is uh, a position that is funded by categorical uh, funds. It's not a general funded position. At the junior high, it would be similar to a suspension center where we have an instructional assistant type person, instruction, an intervention center assistant who uh, works with the students perhaps on homework or other projects, or, uh, but they're under the guidance of a certificated employee. Uh, and the Healthy Start, there are two positions there. 
education right. coordinator and a mm -hmm. Healthy Start mm -hmm. office assistant. Yeah. Could you explain those? Sure. This is uh, actually the first time that we've had to, to go into the Healthy Start ACES program. And again, um, through Teresa Weisglass, this is a projection. Um, she anticipates there'll be a cut in her funding uh, for the next year. So again, we're looking at perhaps cutting these positions. Um, it is her goal, obviously, that the funding will kind of sort out and, and she will be able to retain these positions. But that is, so that is a specific categorical program. It is, it's, it's, that it's may specifically. Be cut and, these are, and these are directly right. Okay. Exactly, okay. that's how these positions are funded. They it's actually not Title One or something like no, that. No, it's okay. not, it's actually through a Healthy and Start. That, that intervention coordinator, what, what, what funding is that? Uh, the Santa Barbara Junior High? Yeah. Uh, I don't have that, uh, I believe. I would have to get back to you, Dr. Yeah. Noel. I would pro yeah. my, most of these positions are Title I EIA. Um, That's what I was so, gonna say, it uh, sounds like Title right, I really. Right. And, but the school health assistance, all these uh, fractional cuts, mm -hmm. there are, that's general fund. Those, the reduction of hours um, with the school health assistance are part of the general fund. They are not categorically funded. These are general funded. We had agreed last year in our negotiations to make reductions and changes in the elementary. Um, those were implemented um, partially this year. We followed through already and agreed upon for 0910 for, to continue that reduction um, and have all the school health assistant, assistance on parity at six hours per day. That was so an actually a previously mm -hmm. approved last spring as a I can't hear you very well. That was previously approved last spring as a budget reduction and it took this long to negotiate and implement going into 910. But we will memorialize that and count it when we go through our budget reduction process later in April. Any other Thank questions? You. Thank you very much. Mr. Heron. Uh, in your background, the very first sentence says that um, the notification from our site administrators to make recommendations. So have all of these come as a result of recommendations from the, the sites themselves? So that, it's not, that's correct. It's not us imposing something on them. They were part of no, the absolutely process. Absolutely not. There, there were recommendations. And, and it's something that we talked about just the other day. Um, some of the schools chose to look at personnel costs, which again are, are a higher percentage. Others looked at <coughs> perhaps some other cuts in materials, instructional materials, other program cuts that didn't impact staff. So we did see a, 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 a dis discrepancy, I guess, if you want to say it, from from some, from some sites to another. Um, the ones that you're that are reflected here were, came directly from the administrators as a recommendation, reluctantly. To, to come forth, um, perhaps in, in their budget and then with their site councils, they may be looking at other areas to cut funds, not not personnel cuts. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Noel. Uh, another question, I'm sorry. But, uh, mm -hmm. Several of the schools that are re receiving categorical cuts, uh, I would assume it's Title I money, but again, a real money, uh, their, their program improvement school, uh, program improvement requires you to make these expenditures. Uh, is this still within the, will, will with, with these cuts, will these schools still be in compliance with their requirements as program improvement schools? I would anticipate that that would be the case. Um, these are not cutting all of their funds. These are just some of the funds that, that are there allocated. So again, they're just, trying to, to predict what p what potentially can happen, but I think from my understanding, it still yeah. protects the programs and it still protects the, um, the PI, I P1 status that they're in. I think it might be helpful to talk about the genesis of the cuts and the process that was used. When we knew that there was going to be flexibility among state categoricals, we actually said we think about 50% of your current year apportionment is gonna be shifted. Well, that didn't materialize exactly how we projected, but what did happen is specified categoricals on the state side called tier three categoricals. We basically identified that one, we knew that it was gonna take a 20% deficit or reduction of current year apportionment between this year and next year. And we knew that we would take about 30% of that remainder as a transfer from the restricted to unrestricted side. A and that's when we talk about these categorical tier three flexibility transfers and we'll talk more about that next month. So as a result of that, our 50% was not that far off, 
And so in an effort to have their categoricals, their state categoricals be self-contained, and I hate to use this word, but it's an appropriate use, and not encroach on the unrestricted general fund, then basically we ask the sites to prioritize what they need, you know, or, or basically prioritize the use of their categorical funds. And sometimes you see Title I positions on here because of the interrelationship between state and federal categoricals but we don't anticipate any decrease and we actually anticipate an increase in federal categoricals. So the layout or the list is a little bit confusing in that regard because what we're really talking about is what the impetus for this list was basically the decrease in state categoricals. So, so th I guess what I'm trying to say is we don't have, um, we don't think it'll have any effect on you know the program improvement plans or status of those sites. All right, I do need a motion to approve the classified general fund and categorical positions reductions and layoffs due to lack of funds or lack of work. So moved. And I need a second. Second. With no further discussion, and I don't believe we have any public comment on this item. Um, um, yes. Um, there, there has been an edit, and just um, I don't think it changes anything because that person doesn't exist. But right, it, it, there's not. Um, it's just there, a, there an is extra just line. a deletion yeah. of that line on that first section. Um, so, all those in favor? Aye. 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 And it passes unanimously. Thank you. We will now move to E5, Board Action on Student Expulsion Case Numbers. In Case 0809 Four nine, I move that we ap approve the stipulated uh, agreement for a one-year calendar, uh, one calendar year expulsion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 It passes unanimously. In case 0809-29, uh, I move that we approve the revocation of the suspended expulsion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 It passes unanimously. In case 0708-09, I move that we uh, reject the student's request for readmittance to home high, the home high school. Home yeah, you just say the home, the the home, home high home school. Home. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And that passes unanimously. Okay, um, we are we're running behind, but I'd like to go ahead and get on to uh, item F1, the discussion on possible name change for the Santa Barbara High School District. Well, the board heard a proposal on renaming the high school district at the January 27, 2009 board meeting. Lanny Ebenstein uh, spoke to the board. I believe there are two issues involved. First of all, the name of our secondary district currently known as Santa Barbara High School District should convey uh, the inclusion of the other South Coast communities so that the public recognizes that the district includes uh, the entire South Coast from Goleta through Montecito uh, and that would show up on bond levies, uh, uh, ballot initiatives, state testing, property ownership, things like that. And secondly, the name should convey inclusion of junior high students, not just grades 9 through 12. Um, this, is, this is actually in a different context because of what we did just a few years ago in becoming a single resolution district. In becoming a single resolution district, we adopted an overall title for the district. That overall title is Santa Barbara School Districts. We use that for most purposes. We use it for correspondence. We use it for most of our public, uh, uh, public advertisements, uh, most of our public relations. We don't go by the specific elementary district title, the technical title for the elementary district and the technical title for the secondary district. But those technical titles are used when it comes to things such as CBEDS data, ballot initiatives, and we saw this in the last ballot uh, uh, election where um, 
some of the public didn't realize that uh, living in Goleta or living in Montecito that the Santa Barbara High School District was the school district that serves students in their area. Most of the districts in the state are configured K-8 as elementary districts, 9-12 as high school districts. We adopted those same titles and that was all done years ago. Uh, by contrast with what we do in this district, uh, in the Santa Inez Valley, all of the K-8 districts serve K-8 students and uh, all of the all of those elementary students then feed into a high school district that is a 912 district. Uh, I believe there are six communities in the Santa Inez Valley that do that. On, in North County, there are five communities that, that are elementary districts, K-8, uh, and a high school district that's a 912 district. Well, by having a title such as Santa Barbara High School District, uh, it adds confusion uh, if for the technical use. And I believe, and I'm recommending to the board, that the board make two changes. One would be to do something with that technical title so that it's more inclusive of the other communities here on the South Coast. And the other is that we change uh, the portion that, that refers to high school to something like secondary so that it's clear that it's a, a junior high high school district or a 712 district. All right, um, I think we have public comment on this item, so shall we take that before we have board discussion? Okay. Mrs. Wilson, followed by Mr. Ebenstein, Ebenstein Lanny, and followed by Mr. Wheeler. Hello, I'm Laura Wilson, uh, and I just think this is a really good idea, um, mostly for just simple clarity. And um, I'm sure all of you have been at meetings around town talking about school stuff, and it's so hard to explain to people <laughs> when the names are so close. You find yourself getting your tongue all twisted up in these districts. And, um, you know, it's Bright people simply do not get that they're, that the entire, you know, South Coast area is, outside of CARP, is part of one secondary district. Very bright people do not get it. I was at a meeting, they were having major discussions of how basic aid was going to affect it because of what the, you know, and you have to go, wait a minute, different district. Oh. You mean we don't have to worry about that? Not this week. <laughs> so it's just, it's really confusing to them. And um, I, I just think it would help tremendously for clarity. Um, I like the South Coast Secondary District. I put my little plug in for that. Because it isn't like any other name. It doesn't, it's not confusing at all. People from Goleta through Montecito, Hope District, they'll all get that they are going to be part of, a d you know, this secondary entity that includes them all and is not the Santa Barbara Elementary District. It is not the Santa Barbara anything. It's the South, you know, it's a South Coast entity. I mean, it, obviously macro it is, but for all the purposes of voting and explaining to people the differences, it would be just a hugely useful thing. Um, also, I think we get better press coverage. <laughs> it's just easier to, to discriminate these things as they're talked about when you've got a different handle on it. Um, there have been many times when I've read in, in very, all, all the various papers we now have, um, I've read something about a school board meeting and I thought, wait a minute, they're talking about a different district and they didn't know it. You know, and it's, you know, people aren't, it's not that reporters don't get it. It is just flat out confusing. Um, also, I think that- 30 uh, seconds. Cl okay, clarifies things for the elementary district as well, in that it's very clear to those, those sets of parents and those teachers and, and those kids that they're part of something that is distinct as well. So I think it's a real good idea. Thank Thanks. you. 
Lanny, followed by Lane. President Parker, members of the board, Dr. Sarvis. Um, I, I think it's, it's excellent that this uh, uh, suggestion is back uh, before you, and I would encourage you to uh, consider this proposal. Uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, I thought what would be a good way to convey it is play a mind experiment. Let's say that through some quirk, the district were named the Dos Pueblos High School District. Nobody in Santa Barbara would know they're part of the Dos Pueblos High School District. And the point is, sure, we're all aware of it because we're involved in the system and have been involved in the system for years. Um, but I think that there really is a problem for people who are coming into the district uh, that they're, they're just not, they're not familiar with it. And I, I think that it does make a difference. I think it makes a difference in school board races with people knowing which candidates they should be voting for, which offices they can run for. I think it makes a difference in bond elections. I think it makes a difference in parcel tax elections. Uh, on the recent parcel tax, it received 71% of the vote. Hey, when you're only 4% above, every percent or two makes a difference. And it's something that I would not say this is the greatest issue that uh, the, the Santa Barbara school districts will rise or fall. But, but the point is, I think that incremental change is always positive. Uh, when we change the name of the uh, Santa Barbara school district to the Santa Barbara elementary school district, it clarified the circumstances. I spoke with two members of the Goleta City Council. Uh, over the weekend who both thought the name should change. I know that individuals affiliated with Santa Barbara Junior High are very keen on trying to encourage uh, more identification between uh, the junior high to encourage parents to feed into our district. And if they think it's a high school district, it's not good. The only suggestion I would make as, as an addition, I, I think it should be Santa Barbara should be in the title. So I, I think either the names Santa Barbara Galita Montecito uh, Secondary District, uh, uh, Santa Barbara Area Secondary District, or another possibility I thought would be the Santa Barbara Coast Secondary District. So in any event, I think that any of those would be an improvement on uh, what there is now. I, I think that Santa Barbara Galita Montecito would be the most descriptive. Thank you. Mr. Wheeler. I'll take off my union hat and put on my parent hat. Um, in a time when we are... Uh, under a constant uh, veil of uh, budget considerations, I believe this is an excellent opportunity to have naming rights. I could see a $25 million naming right being sold to the Oprah Winfrey Foundation, and this being the Oprah Winfrey uh, School District. I, I think we have to think outside of the economic <laughs> box here, and this is certainly one of the ways to do so. I think there needs to be staff, and if this is a secondary uh, uh, involvement. I think student uh, involvement should be heard on this also because the kids are the ones who wear this and the teachers are the ones who wear this on a daily basis. The third and I think essential piece of this consideration needs to be acronym. Because as I sat there in my feeble state and just concocted a couple of these, I found out that one uh, has the uh, acronym of S-B-A-S-S-D. So I'm not sure If that's really the moniker we want to take forward into the next, <laughs> excuse me, next decade. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Board members. Any comments, suggestions, other names? Yes, Dr. Noel. Yeah, I, I, uh, I like, I, I like that bottom one, Greater Santa Barbara. I think the problem with the South Coast is that there is Carpinteria. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, it doesn't make a great acronym. <laughs> haven't, haven't given it that much uh, careful thought, Elaine. Uh, but, uh, but it has the word Santa Barbara, and I agreed with, uh, with uh, uh, the thought that that ought to be there. Uh, that's all. Other members? Mrs. Deacon? Well, there's, there's a number of ways to look at this. I mean, either less or more, basically. Um, I mean, you can be all-inclusive and have a very lengthy name, which mm -hmm. to me seems overly cumbersome. We could shrink it down to the South Coast District, um, but then there is the confusion with Carpinteria. Um, actually, the Santa Barbara Coast Secondary that, what was it? The Santa Barbara? The Santa Barbara Coast Santa Barbara Secondary Coast District. District. No, just Santa Barbara Coast Secondary District. Maybe. Which is um, nice. I mean, 
for someone who lives in Goleta and doesn't necessarily always identify with Santa Barbara, yeah, I mean, there, there's true. also that consideration in that we are more than Santa Barbara, and even though Santa Barbara is a region, it's also a city, and, and that's therein much of the confusion lies. And then certainly as someone who just ran for election and many supporters who didn't know they could vote for me, uh, you know, it's, you know, I, I think it does make sense to, to make some kind of change here. Mrs. Cordero? Well, I'm, I'm, I might be, I, I, I guess I am in the minority, but I, I f I'm I not clear on why we're tackling this at this point. I feel like we have so many really serious issues and so many controversies going on with the board and deci with decision decisions that we have to make right now that I feel like we're almost looking for another controversy um, to stir up, f and I'm not sure exactly what we stand to gain from it, because while I agree that the name can be confusing, and, and I think all of us who have run for school board know we've all run into people who say, I can't vote for you because I'm not in your district. I live in Goleta or I live in Montecito. But all we do is say, oh, yes, you can, because it includes everything from Montecito Elwood or past, and then they say okay. So, and when our names show up on their ballot, they vote. And the same thing with the parcel tax. When the parcel tax shows up on their ballot, they vote on it. Um, so, while I understand that it's confusing, I feel like it's, like we're dealing with so many much more serious issues that it seems like something well, like we're taking on so something unnecessarily uh, sort of divisive or potentially divisive. I, I mean, Mr. Wheeler mentioned getting students' response and like in staff response, and I can just see people lining up on different sides of this, and it just seems like much ado about nothing. So my concern is if we were in a time, uh, which I've never seen, of where very little is going on and we have everything taken care of, sure, let's deal with, with this. But in a time where we have a million things that we're really struggling with, it, it seems unnecessary. Mr. Heron. Uh, thank you. I, I agree a lot with uh, Mrs. Cordero. <laughs> I would like to see a game plan. If we did decide to go forward, what other steps, what kind of input, I mean, what would be a game plan to gather and, and, and then decide whether that process is worth it. Um, because, you know, I know that in everything I did in the campaign, it was Santa Barbara, Goleta, Montecito. I mean, I just pushed that. And so if I, had, if I had to choose one of these, that's the one I would choose. It's a long name. Uh, but it sure tells people exactly what it is. Uh, I've been through it with the Real Estate Association where we changed our name to the Greater South Coast Association of Realtors with this same theory that we wanted to cover a big area. It bombed. We changed my dad. Um, my dad pushed that. I pushed the chain back uh, to Santa Barbara uh, because it was, just, it was just too big of a mouthful. Um, so uh, I, you know, if, if it was an easy decision, we make it, do it, get on with our lives. But if it's going to take a lot of communication, a lot of packed meeting rooms, now may not be the time to do it unless there's an economic reason to do it. Um, I actually w have a question for Dr. Ebenstein, and maybe you could come to the mic and answer this question because you were, I, I'm not sure from your comments if you were actually part of the process or if you were an observer, but when the district went from the Santa Barbara School District to the Santa Barbara Elementary School District, how controversial was that? Well, um, in, in truth, uh, I'm not sure if a, a single person showed up to the meeting in terms of it was something that it was a, it was a similar situation in terms of, and I, I appreciate the comment that, as I say, this is, you know, not, not things aren't going to rise and fall, but the point was it was really confusing with Santa Barbara School District because what does that what refer to particularly within our complex structure here? And uh, so the proposal was made, well, why don't we change it to Santa Barbara Elementary School District? Uh, this was in the early 90s. Uh, Margaret Connell was on the board at the time, and um, Mary Stanley, uh, Barbara Goodenow, uh, Lee Sharfeld, and myself. And uh, 
<clears throat> the um, and so we, you know, the superintendent made a recommendation. It was put on the agenda. No one showed up. We all voted for it. And the next time they printed the stationery, they changed it. So it, it's something that it, it really wasn't something that took up much time. It did take up any cost in terms of, as far as I know, I mean, mm -hmm. in terms of, so it, it was something that was handled in a very low key manner. And uh, historically, the district, uh, Lacumbre Junior High, when it added the sixth graders, was renamed uh, Lacumbre Middle School. And then when it was back to the uh, seventh and eighth, they changed it back to Junior High. And similarly with Peabody Charter School, it, its name changed officially from Peabody Elementary School to Peabody Charter School. So it's something that these sorts of situations have come up. And in truth, I, I can't remember any controversy on them in terms of, uh, and, and, and not much interest. But I believe that in each case, uh, Lacumbra felt that it was better off to be more clear at each step in the way. And uh, it's more or less a historical misnomer. And uh, I, I think that it's something that if you if you can make a little incremental progress, my view is you do it. And you know, as I said, if it you know, that, so that would right. be my only comment. Thank you. Um, oh, can I ask him a question? Yes, sure, Mr. Evans. As long as you're there, sure. um, I, I think the elementary is a lot different issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was pretty basic. You said you talked to two city council people in Goleta. Yeah, right. What names did you propose to them, mm -hmm. and what were they ha happy with? Well, they they looked at it. And um, you know, I, I'm I'm a little reluctant to quote people, uh, so well, I, no. won't, I won't say did, exactly who they it like was. They like the fact that Galita was in the name. Yeah, okay, well, I'll, I'll say one of them thought Santa Barbara that that uh, the Santa Barbara area one was. The, they both thought the secondary district idea was good because of the unclarity on that point, and uh, one was inclined in the direction of Santa Barbara area, and the other one was Santa Barbara Galita was was stronger on Santa Barbara Galita Montecito. So yeah. for what that's what that's what those two thought. May I, may yes. I make a comment? Mm -hmm. um, I know we've heard comments about uh, logos and, and titling. Uh, I just wanted to be clear that we use Santa Barbara School Districts, and you see that on stationery, you see it on shirts, you see it on the sides of vehicles. We would continue to use that. There wouldn't be any change in that. Uh, so by changing the name of the secondary district, it doesn't mean that we would change any of our stationery, uh, any of our emblems. Uh, we would change the sign right out front that mm -hmm. says Santa Barbara High School District right now. And Santa Barbara School District that has never Barbara been changed. And Santa Barbara School District that's the wrong name <laughs> for the elementary mm -hmm. district. So if we got them both wrong, we'd finally, mm -hmm. finally remove that. And we have, instead, we have on the outside of this building, we have Santa Barbara School Districts, mm -hmm. which was our new title from the single district resolution. So. So most of our titling, uh, I mean, this would not affect most of our titling, nor would it affect most of our discussions. When most of us talk about the high school district or about the secondary district, we simply call it, in fact, most of us call it the secondary district. Uh, so in common usage, we refer to it as the secondary district. Uh, sometimes we call it the high school district if we want to be a little more technical. Uh, but no one really uses the title Santa Barbara High School District. It's only used on the state documents, on ballots, on you know those those for those technical uses. Um, I would like to go ahead and have a moment here, <laughs> so if I could have my turn. Um, I want to say that I agree that um, that this is something that while minor. Uh, it would be a, a fairly simple change to make things better. Um, and so I would love just to be able to move forward with a name change. However, uh, I don't see it as something, well, I, I, th I think it would be great for us to put out an e-news and, and let the press know that we're thinking of changing the name. I'm not interested in some sort of polling process where, um, you know, the greatest number, you know, wants the, you know, Frankenstein School District and therefore we're going to change to that. Um, I, uh, I think it would at least, it wouldn't answer all of the problems or, or any controversies, but um, at least moving from high school to secondary would be a very simple change to make that I hope we could do on a consent agenda. I personally really like Dr. Ebenstein's last suggestion, the Santa Barbara Coast Secondary District. Um, that helps in a lot of ways in terms of um, uh, sort of being regional but not too regional. Um, so I do like that, but um, that's, that's where I stand on it, so 
Other members? Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, too, at a minimum, I think we can put secondary in there. But, um, but I still am also open to a more inclusive name. Um, maybe I'm partial to South Coast just because I used to be on the South Coast Community Aquatic <laughs> Center. <laughs> but, um, but at any rate, I, my one concern about greater is that um, as people, say, search on the Internet for titles and things, we probably want maybe a more specific word to come up first. That would be my only concern about that possible name. Right, and that's a concern too. If you just use South Coast, not only is there issue with Carpinteria, but it needs to pull up Santa Barbara first when you're looking on the CDE codes and all those things, so. Other members? Well, I was gonna say in light of uh, Dr. Evenstein's comment that incremental change might be good, that I see nothing wrong with just changing high school to secondary. That seems totally non-controversial. Yeah, I can't imagine <laughs> anybody objecting to, to that change. It was sort of like adding elementary to San Marcos School District. Um, so, I mean, I think we could at the very least start with that. Okay. And then the others might be a little more, you know, I'm not sure we, we would necessarily all be in agreement of which one right. we like, but um, certainly secondary seems benign enough. Any other board member comments? Would board members be willing for us to get on a consent agenda, simply just uh, a, a fir as a first step moving from Santa Barbara High School District to Santa Barbara Secondary District? Would that be an acceptable first step and then we can talk further in the future about? Um, a caveat here. Yes. I, if we change the name, if we go to secondary, then we will go to the, the CDE and we will tell them that we have changed the name and right. we'll use a resolution to do that. So they'll change all the records and all of the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, for instance, we have a document that comes out of the Department of Education that lists all of the school districts, and it lists districts like ours as single resolution districts under their technical names, so they'll print all the documents in that way. If we go to a further change, uh, we shouldn't do it for a good year, so. I think that that would be acceptable. <laughs> um, Mr. Heron? Yeah. I guess I just questioned the consent calendar. I mean, uh, it sounds, we can sit here and say that sounds real easy. Um, but that, is that making a presumption that there won't be any uh, discussion or, or concerns? Well, or, I mean, what, what's the harm of putting it on as an action item? Um, just in terms of being speed, because we have so many other things going on, we could always pull it. I think that it would be great if we put it out in e-news that the board is considering changing the name of the Santa Barbara High School District to the Santa Barbara Secondary District and to local media. Um, we could put it on the consent agenda and then simply pull it if there are members of the public here or if we start getting emails and so on. Yeah, I would object to that uh, procedure. Mm -hmm. Just if, we're gonna, if, if we entertain the idea of it being on the regular agenda, let's put it on so it has the visibility. Uh, peop a lot of people don't read the consent agenda. But that's, that's also fine with me. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Let us go ahead and take our break. And we're only running 20 minutes behind at this point. So um, this is perfect <laughs> to continue on with item F2, the report on ready to bid construction projects. And here's Dr. Sarvis to introduce Mr. Hetyank. Dave Hetyank is our director of facilities. Dave. Thank you, Dr. Sarvis, members of the board. Uh, first, I want to apologize that uh, for this agenda item, I started off with uh, referencing the board brief, and after it got moved from agenda to agenda to agenda, the attachment in this agenda ended up not being with it. So the first part of that board brief is up on the overhead. Uh, construction projects that are ready to bid uh, for the elementary district, currently this summer we plan on doing three small projects that are either out to bid or will be out to bid soon. Uh, at Peabody Charter School, we're required to do a modification to install an entry ramp at the front of the school. That's a result of our Mitchum lawsuit settlement. Uh, we're also required to put an additional restroom at that site. That's on hold. Uh, the vendor's in bankruptcy. We have legal counsel reviewing uh, the contract on that. We've only paid them a minimum, minimal amount. 
They have, they're not only in bankruptcy, that they did not respond to DSA on getting their plan back check and DSA canceled the application. So we're truly back to square one on that one. Uh, we've notified Logan Hopper, our, our lawsuit compliance person, and, and he's given us extension while legal counsel uh, deals with it. We just wanna make sure that we're clear before we go to another vendor uh, to get that portable delivery installed. Two small projects this summer at McKinley Elementary School, uh, a stage lift and, and a, a little ramp work. Uh, other projects that are ready to bid, uh, Washington Elementary School portable reconfiguration, the final phase of that uh, is ready to go is, and we're working on finding a funding source. In addition, uh, award, uh, in, I believe it's tonight's agenda on uh, the contract for Franklin Elementary School uh, heating ventilating replacement. This is Williams lawsuit settlement money. It was a grant. The money's in the county treasurer. We have it. We can't use it for any other purpose or at any other place. Um, coming back to the uh, agenda uh, document when I talk about issues with the elementary district, uh, there are the, the three the Peabody Charter School ramp, the McKinley stage lift that I mentioned there. Uh, again, repeating, the restroom is still being reviewed by legal counsel, Washington ready to bid. And then one thing that we have left over on plans are four elementary sites where the modernization was reduced to include ADA required work only by our lawsuit settlement. Peabody, the second phase of their modernization, uh, Adams, Cleveland and Franklin. The, basically, we have a set of plans. We've done part of the work on those sets of plans. The rest of the work has not been done. So it would be a matter of taking those plans back with the architect, delineating the scope of work that's already been completed, eliminating that verbally by shading areas on the plans, and, and then putting them out to bid. So they're not street ready today, but they could be street ready in a relatively very short period of time. Uh, the Adams uh, Library was ready to bid. It's more than five years old, so that plan has been canceled by DSA. It's gone beyond the five-year limit, so the architect would have to resubmit that from basically stage one with DSA, but based on that design or a modification to that design, a lot of that work would have already been done, yeah, uh, pr preliminary work. Uh, priorities four and five. don't know what those are without the attachment, but there's the attachment. Uh, priorities four and five then w would need a design. For the secondary district, uh, the, both the uh, Santa Barbara High School main kitchen expansion renovation and the Dos Pueblos High School heating ventilation have plans uh, are ready to hit the street. Uh, th those projects are, are ready to go. Uh, the remaining priority two and priority three projects um, have almost complete design. They're part of it. Most of those are part of another package where we could pull it out or the design has, has progressed to a certain point and then we put the architects or the engineers on hold or the project would be a simple design and could be ready and on the street in a relatively short period of time. And I know we've talked about stimulus, stimulus money coming down, uh, myself uh, and, and Mr. Smith and, and Dr. Sarvis ha have discussed this almost on a daily basis. Uh, we know money's coming, we don't know how much, we don't know exactly when, we don't know uh, how much is gonna be passed directly to schools, how much the state will be able to put their hands on uh, to stabilize their budget rather than passing on to schools to stabilize their portion of the budget. Uh, those we're waiting for the basically the federal government to write the rules on how the money is to be distributed. Well, <laughs> I was going to add something, but Dave's I think I heard think the he speech a few it. times. <laughs> yeah, I've listened to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we have none of the details. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a number of board members attended a dinner. Uh, where there was a speaker that said, yes, yes, this money is coming, but we still don't know anything about it. Okay, board members, Mrs. Deacon. Um, I would just say my biggest concern here would be that if money 
was available and we didn't have a way to spend it because we didn't have plans ready, we'd be kicking ourselves. So, I mean, I know that's a worst case scenario, but I, I just want to make sure that if, if money does come, we're ready to spend it. Other board members? Well, let, let me suggest mm -hmm. that uh, if the money did come, the first thing we do in the elementary district is get this portable project yeah. done that was unplugged by the Attorney General opinion. And the second thing we do is run forward with the uh, Santa Barbara High School main kitchen. So we would get those things going immediately. Yeah. The main kitchen does have some matching funds for the career technical education portion of that project, but those matching funds probably wouldn't be available back to the district for another 11 or 12 months from what we understand now is the best case scenario. So that'd be something where you could spend the money and then realize the savings when the funds became available to offset the previous costs. You could expense adjust the money from once it comes to the county treasury. And I, I want to uh, let new board members know in particular that those modernization projects in the elementary district that didn't happen, there's millions of dollars worth of work there. So yeah. um, there we, that would certainly uh, take anything and everything uh, plus, there'd still be things that's didn't get done. Um, you certainly couldn't do all of them. Um, but but are they? Are, I thought I understood some of those are out of date and, and no, only, not Adams library. only the library design okay, the library. is okay. out of date. Are, are any Adams. others? Uh, yes, Dr. Uh, is the clock running on some of the others? The clock is running, but we're not at, at the five-year point yet. Thank right. You. Um, I do want to say uh, two things. One, of course, it's very disappointing. I, I can't believe, it seems like yesterday that those plans for the Adams Library were just passed, uh, and just came back from the DSA, so it's very disappointing that five years have gone by. And all this time has gone by, and we haven't been able to even have plans for the Washington Elementary Library, and I just, um, it breaks my heart that those have not happened. Um, and for members of the public that are watching where it says priority two, four, and five, I think it would be good to explain that priority three was Franklin, the work that was done at Franklin, but it got bumped up and, and acted on because there were state matching grants for it. Correct, yeah. We, we had matching funds for, for, the, for that modernization, and, and we acted on, on those. And that's what uh, basically replaced the old portables with permanent buildings. Any other comments, board members? Um, I know that we are just, uh, we can't be half as eager as you are to find out if, if there's money and then how much money that there is. So I know you'll keep us posted. Hopefully s soon we can come with some good news. Thank you. We have one public comment. Mr. Wheeler. Thank you, Lane Wheeler, Santa Barbara Teacher Association. I just wanted to remind uh, you, uh, we're certainly not trying to adjust your priorities, but uh, over the last two years, I've had numerous calls from the teachers at Franklin Elementary regarding their heating and air conditioning. Well, actually, air conditioning is not the issue. It's the heating issue. And they have the portable, little portables, and we've, we've done a lot of stop stopgap measures to make that happen and, and uh, get them through. And I, I would certainly uh, encourage you to make sure that stays as a top priority. And thank you very much. And, and I'll just chime in there, Mr. Wheeler, that we approved the bid on that on the consent agenda. You'll be happy to hear. Okay, um, item F3, report on overlapping city and school districts land title interests at various school campuses. Well, again, we're gonna call on Dave Het Young's talents and expertise. Uh, we've been dealing with the city on these issues for quite a while at our last, uh, was it our last joint city council meeting or the previous one, the previous one, I think. Uh, we did have a report from the city on overlapping uh, land use issues. And one of our board members asked for a further report here so that we could have some discussion here with our own board about it. So Dave Hattenyunk, our Director of Facilities and Operations. Well, you have in the, thank you, Dr. Sarvis, members of the board, what you have in the agenda tonight is, is the city presentation that was given uh, in September of 2008. I have both the PowerPoint uh, and, and the written portion and so uh, I'm not sure which you'd rather go through, uh, what clarifications uh, you'd like me to go over, but basically in both the elementary and the secondary district in years past, uh, city property was vacated, city streets mainly were vacated uh, to allow the district to encroach on them, build on them to create campuses such as Franklin Elementary, Santa Barbara High School, 
uh, where you do have streets that end up coming into a T, a, a T intersection. Um, some of these streets were never officially vacated by the city or they were vacated using an incorrect street name in the case of the Carrillo Street uh, uh, access. And so while they, while they, they ba basically they've been vacated, but the fee, I guess the technical terms, the fee title has not been given up. So in actuality, even though the, the city has vacated these, these streets and given the district permission to build, they technically still own the property, not the district. And so uh, the city was, was taking an effort to, to identify those, to clean them up in, in preparation uh, of coming to an agreement with the district on, on, on prop that, that property. And of course, they're interested in obtaining the fire station number five, which is on Lacumbra Junior High School that uh, the city leases for $600 a year. And I think there's another six or seven years. Uh, it's, it's in the PowerPoint uh, uh, wh when that lease is up. Uh, we also have the plot of land at Franklin Elementary School, the other non-street issue. The, there's a plot of land at Franklin Elementary School where four of district-owned portables are on I would call it the west to the west end of the asphalt playground. That area is belongs to the city. Was uh, a, a easement that the district was allowed to use for uh, garden and pathway. And years before I came to the district, the district placed four portables on that property. That was not part of the agreement with the city that it could be used for placement of portables. It's supposed to be used for walkways, pathways, and gardens. Dave, Dave, I'm wondering if board members want to see that so that they see specifically what we're talking about. So or I, I can go through here and <coughs> we can talk about uh, it's, it's Santa Barbara High School. Uh, if you can, you'll see right here Carrillo Street runs underneath the pool and the gym. Okay. When this street was vacated, Instead of using the street name, Dave could use the microphone too. Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> I know you. I always remind everybody else. I forget myself. Hands, <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when the street was vacated, the, the basically what the city has found out that they, they inserted the wrong street name. So instead of vacating at, the, at this point, it was vacated at this point. And of course, you have streets that if they ever connected here, that still in, in fact belong to the city. Uh, this this street going through was vacated, but the city still uh, at one point owned an easement in here for utilities. Uh, they gave up the water easement for that. We now own that section of, of water line when we sold the well over here to the city. And so those are some of the issues at Santa Barbara High School. Santa Barbara High School is just crisscrossed with right-of-ways uh, that have not been um, not been rectified. Let me see here, uh, Bering Strait. Franklin Elementary School, these four portables right here are the ones that are sitting on city property that we have, that, that they allowed us to use as an and is an easement for uh, walkways and pathways. I'm sorry, what street uh, is that? Is this on here? Let me see if it's on the next slide. Well, I know. Mason's down on <laughs> down on the on the right, far right. Uh, yeah, this it's this item. But it's the one where if you if this you made the right, right on here. Mason to go to the street, it's the first, it's the left that just right butts up now next to Sky to the Cesar Chavez School. Yes, and then and then uh, this portion here of this street was never vacated, and then part of that street is where we have uh, four temporary portables sitting for Cesar Chavez that we hope to turn back to the vendor soon. At Washington Elementary, uh, recently uh, the City Planning Commission approved the uh, realignment to land swap, w whatever words we want to use, uh, with, with uh, the Stevens uh, Trust. And so the next step now is for the district to take this parking lot design, review it one last time with the school, submit it to the Division of State Architect, then go back to the city for a coastal permit, 
and then uh, uh, enter into a final agreement with the developer and hopefully uh, next summer we'll see some construction for the new parking lot. There's, uh, that will alleviate the easement issue that, that went across here that was always a problem. There's still some easements down here that, 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 will, that will clear up a lot for Washington. At Lacumbra Junior High School, we own the property that the fire station sits on. There's also uh, a strip along the bottom here that we are occupying that does not belong to us. And there's also an encroachment of asphalt parking lot from these apartments on district property. This easement here that we're sitting on belongs to these apartments and part of their parking lot encroaches on our property. So right now we're kind of encroaching on each other and I haven't really pursued that any further uh, waiting for the city to come up with a recommendation for the fire station and maybe we, then we'd contact the, the owners of this and, and find out if we can recommend a, a reasonable resolution. But, but uh, this part of, of, of the base, in fact, the baseball backstop is, is, is half on property that doesn't belong to the district. What, what is that long strip there that doesn't belong to this, us? This, this, this long strip here is an easement to get from, th oh, this, this dotted line is, is actually the school district property. There's two parcels. But on this side of the property line, uh, there's probably a 12 foot wide section that we're using as playground that our irrigation line set on and that this backstop sets on that, that is not district property. And, and what is the de district design and alteration that we're going to be responsible for taking care of? District design and alteration. Of a wa uh, redirect and avoid drainage of water onto the fire station number five property to avoid water damage to city facilities. Oh, they, the, the city, the city is taught, the city is going to want to acquire land further back from the fire station so they can expand the fire station and at the same time uh, do some modifications back here uh, for drainage. But this, is, this, is, this is the city's PowerPoints, not mine. Yeah, but it says yeah. we're responsible for it. So, well, right, well. It says we're gonna design it and well, alter th it. That, that's what the city's hoping. Well, th I that's I their mean, statements. That, I'm at, that's, oh, that's what we I, have in front I, of I, 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 have no, I have no, I have not been approached by the city formally to, to uh, to do a design or do any work or improvements uh, with that. How much is the city, the, the, the land worth? That the fire, how much? How much is it worth? Is there an appraisal on it? The fire station? We, we've not done an appraisal on that property yet. We're, we're not to that point. We're hoping the city would pay for the appraisal. <laughs> Uh, S Santa Barbara Junior High, uh, basically uh, we still have easements that run through the junior high where the street was vacated. You also, at Santa Barbara uh, Junior High, uh, where is it? Yeah, this, this is, this, this, this vacated street here where they, right here, they're talking about the buildings, they're talking about the PE building. Issues at Santa Barbara Junior High are just minor quick claims back for, for fee. Peabody Charter, uh, the, the school district actually owns property out to this corner of this intersection and down here, which the city is currently encroaching on our property with their streets on both of those intersections. The district also owns this land here where Peabody's parking lot is. So the streets have been realigned on district property without easements.
Cleveland. I'm not sure where the the vacated portion of uh, Villa Vista Street is. Basically, here's the portables, here's the playground, the main parking lot, and then the permanent buildings. But it's, it's San Ines is down in here. We have, we have a, an easement that we walk up from the street on. Okay. You know the path that goes up the hill? It seemed to me that there it's was an easement up through. No, I mean up above the school seemed to me that there was an easement up. Oh, this path uh, no, uh, in here? No, keep going up. Okay. Now go along the hill there to the, to the right. There we go. You keep in going here. there. It seems to me there was an easement in through there. Okay. I'm sure Cleveland will be just, a, again, one of those minor issues mm -hmm. where, where the street was vacated, but, but it was never quit claimed or, uh, uh, or per fee. Uh, the same thing here at Harding, uh, where we have the bridge. And then the city's done some recent, just you know, s uh, storm drain improvements uh, around Harding that have really helped that school with, with drainage when it ra have the heavy rains. McKinley, uh, they have easements for uh, sewer mains and water mains that run through the campus. Okay, McKinley. La Colina, the city has a sewer, just, just a right of way for a sewer that runs across La Colina. So basically, the city has taken on the, the job of, of researching uh, all of the areas where we encroach, they encroach, where we, we're using property that's been vacated, but, but it's not been officially quit claimed or quit claimed correctly, or that the fee title ha has not been uh, changed. And so they are in the process of, of finalizing uh, this report. Uh, of going back through and, and double checking the easements and then uh, their next step I guess is, is to to come to the district uh, and I told I recommended that the, the contact person for this be Mr. Smith that uh, any proposals or or anything would, would need to be uh, taken to Mr. Smith at that level and, and, and Eric of course would, would discuss it with the superintendent and then if there were proposals which we thought were in, in the best interest of the district uh, we discuss them with the board, and then hopefully at some point in the future there'd be some sort of uh, action at a joint meeting to, to clean up the easements and the fees. Uh, and we know that the city wants the fire station, and we know that we have portables sitting on city property at Franklin. So we'll see what proposals come forth. Okay, thank you. Board members, any questions? All right, with that we will move on I to... Did, um, oh, oh, oh there's public comment. Oh, there's public comment on this, oh, goody. We wonder why there's two people in the audience. That's <laughs> 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 very unusual. <laughs> um, Laura Wilson, followed by Lanny Emberstein. Uh, let's see. A couple things that come to mind. Um, certainly, the fire station is valuable. I mean, the land. I mean. Any land in Santa Barbara is valuable. <laughs> so <laughs> you don't give anything away in this town. Um, and I guess just as a, a general thing, uh, I, I'm assuming the city will share the title searches and everything, all those documents with somebody from the district because, you know, it's, it's pretty cut and dried and I assume that you'd have access to all that information because it might be important. Um, the other thing I, that puzzled me was if somebody has, and maybe I'm just wrong on this, but that's their sewers, right? And so if they have an easement, they're responsible for it. If, it's, if they give it to you, does that mean you're responsible for the sewer? I'm not sure how that works, but that would be something you'd, 
definitely don't want to be responsible for the city's sewers to the extent that you can avoid it. Um, the document from the city standpoint looks like a cleanup of minor issues. I'm sure that's how they sort of view it, but it does seem like the fire station is a really key element in that cleanup. And, um, you know, once again, don't give it away <laughs> because it is, it's a valuable piece. It might be a bargaining piece for something else. But, um, you know, this obviously is their viewpoint. You haven't had your input yet. The negotiations, the give and take hasn't started, but um, just, I guess, buyer beware. Thank you. President Parker, members of the board, Dr. Sarvis. Um, well, I, I think the relationship between the city and the school district is obviously vital. And it's a generally good relationship. And it's something that truly is. These are the two leading institutions in the community when it comes to community services from so many perspectives. And uh, just to sound off a little bit, I, I have always felt that the district has given a little bit more than the city, and you know, once again, maybe that's my perspective, but it, it's something that I, I think that's objectively the case. And the, uh, you know, I think, for example, of the joint use agreement between the city and the school district, there's sure a lot more city use of school district facilities than there is school district use of city facilities. In fact, I would guess it's probably you know 10 to 1, 20 to 1, 30 to 1. And I mean, I, I almost can't, I can't, almost can't think of a school of a city facility that the school district uses, whereas the city use of the school facilities is unending in terms of it's it's constant. And at least some years ago, I remember the city, in in, in exchange for that, gave twenty thousand dollars a year for maintenance or something along that line. And there's so so as I say, I mean, the point is, is that in other communities, the redevelopment agency funds have been used to build schools. There's annual transfers for recreation programs that are just straight line items. And, and it's something that the city of Santa Barbara is a wealthy city and they have not done that sort of thing. And um, so and anyway, that's a general comment. But <clears throat> I noted that the, one of the comments was about uh, Washington, was that in 1991 the city granted the district the parcel of land adjacent to Washington School. Hey, I, I was on the school board at that time. I had not come to speak to this item tonight, but having been here for the other, I have noticed this. And I'm, I'm almost positive that the district paid $50,000 for that land and that we had some negotiations with the city. And I, I think that would be important to find out because it you know, might help to indicate sort of the general tenor of the document. And it's something that um, re really the, the land issues that the district would be getting are easements that white, weren't quite done quite rightly dec decades ago. But the city's saying, well, we'd like the fire station, maybe a little bit of land next to it. D don't underestimate the value of that land around Peabody, too, because those were some issues of how that site could be improved and and it's important and and then uh it's it's important that uh uh you know i i think these should be looked at in a in a larger in a larger context and it's something that i would not rush precipitously into this but i, I think that it should be part of larger discussions on the calle cesar chavez property perhaps on joint use and those sort of things thank you Thank you, and Dr. Eubenstein, I've been getting to spend some fun time in the junior high school archives of the board minutes, so this will be something else that would be good to look at. Thank you. Um, any other board comments on this? Dr. Noel. Is there, is it possible, possible to put a monetary value on the city's interest at the Franklin site? If Dr. Noel, if, if you're speaking about the property that belongs to the city where we have four portables sitting, uh, the easiest way to establish a value would be an appraisal. But, but uh, we, we've not commissioned an appraisal for that, nor to my knowledge has the city. Because uh, the reason I ask is that on, a, on some occasions when I've mentioned the uh, fire station and I'd, I did not mention the land behind the fire station, uh, City folks have immediately talked about Franklin, and it's as though like it's as though that's a wash, and uh, 
and I would love to know. Uh, I, I, I don't, I don't believe I would assume that anything is washed without valid appraisals. Good to hear that. Mr. Herring. Yeah, I wasn't on the board in September when this was discussed, but I was at the meeting, and I didn't get the feel at all that there was any discussion about valuations. It was, in fact, on page 8 of 10 on Lagum La Cumbra. I mean, it really says, in consideration of city's relinquishment of various lands and easements, the district's conveyance of the, of the city of land uh, fire station number five. I mean, it sounds like a given. There's, the city is saying, for everything we're giving you, you're giving us this. And are you sure you're negotiating with them on these things? Or are they under the impression that, you know, you look at your last slide. I, I mean, I, well, the, yeah. the city's slide, not my slide. Well, well, I, I, and I, I have not definitely not entered into any negotiations or had discussions with the city right. on what the district would or would not be willing to I do. I understand that. But the, the next steps, if you read the next steps, it's pretty mundane. We're going to do this, and here's the paperwork, and we're going to have a meeting to <coughs> approve all these documents. I mean, to me, there's an awful lot missing if the intent is to try to have try to do anything of evaluation purposes and I, maybe I, we're not but I would I would totally agree with you sir yeah but uh, if they're just sitting there going along with gathering all these documents call you up someday and say hey we got the documents ready where do we sign mm -hmm. you know I mean that's that's the impression I have well, I'm not ready to sign nor recommend that anybody uh, uh, with authority to sign signs thank you <laughs> but you're, you're right that that is that is the path they're going down but but what they are doing is is they are they are spending the the time and effort to, to research all the titles and that was that was their first step and uh, we have discussed and I have been in meetings w with the city where we've talked about uh, the sites just as per facts what what was what was vacated what was not quick claimed what 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 is not fee simple what the district owns what the city owns we've never had any discussions uh, with any city personnel about what any proposals would be I, th I think we know from their slides what their intentions are going to be. Yeah, I think it would help to know specifically which of all these things is truly something of value that the city is entitled to. A lot of this stuff is just mistakes. Right, correct. So w which ones of are mistakes and that there's no way they would ever get back the streets on Santa Barbara High School. I mean, that's no. not, <laughs> not going to happen. No. But how and much, and are, how much are they, do they have that is rightfully theirs that we're encroaching on and and what is ours and what's the value of that I, I think I think there's three areas there's the areas that we saw at Peabody Charter there's the areas at Franklin where we have portables on their property and there's uh, the fire station at La Cumbra that we know that they'd like to obtain and and to me those are those are the three main issues the rest is just clean up of old vacations that 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 in my opinion the district should not be you know paying for that property it's already been vacated it's just a matter of going through and taking if, if you went nine nine tenths of the way in doing it uh, 30 years ago 40 years ago and, and for some reason nobody ever did the last tenth and now it's coming to light that no one did the last tenth that was particularly came to light when we were going to uh, improve the street at uh, Santa Barbara High School to get to the ADA parking uh, down by the pool in the football field. That ADA parking is required as part of our lawsuit settlement and we had to repair the street to be able to get down there. Well, the city says that's our property. So we said, fine, improve the street. Hmm. And then we went from there. All right, uh, Dr. Noel. I forget, never mind. Okay. Board. All right, thank you, Mr. Hedyonk. Um, let's move on to item F4, discussion of separate youth violence steering committee. Well, one of the board members asked for this item. Um, Bob, would you like to speak to this? Yeah, it's, uh, sure. Uh, the context, if I recall correctly, was the, the creation of the uh, committee overseeing the uh, gang intervention specialist position. And, uh, and the thought, what inspired a concern of this was the feeling that that process uh, is tends to be dominated by agencies. Uh, it, it for a long time had, I guess, in its first phase, did not have much public participation, which uh, kind of was expressed at meetings, and uh, and most importantly, that 
the mindset, at least ju judging from what's been done so far in that committee, the mindset is more intervention as distinct from prevention uh, and looking more at the older kids to, and you know, like the ones who are already in big trouble rather than looking at uh, the kids who uh, are at risk of getting into trouble. And, uh, and I know part of that, uh, that discussion had to do with uh, alternative conceptualizations of the, of the process, particularly the ones you find in that uh, uh, Surgeon General's report. And so, the, at least from my point of view, uh, what I think would be useful for us to consider is creating a separate uh, body, committee, uh, I don't know what to call it, uh, would have this ex exclusive focus on prevention uh, programs, focusing particularly on, on schools, which is our business. I think that's everything I, every thought I had on the subject. <laughs> I, I, I know that the, uh, uh, that the Esperanza group uh, was uh, quite interested in that, and I, know, I noticed they're not here, but I think it may have to do with the hour. Uh, but um, before we take board member comments, uh, do you have anything that you would like to chime in with, Dr. Sarvis? Well, uh, perhaps we should describe some of the things that we are doing because there are things that are appropriate for all students. Uh, for instance, our curriculum on Too Good for Drugs and Violence is really designed for all students. Uh, our character programs are designed for all students. We have pyramids of prevention and intervention uh, that, that start to taper and then uh, uh, identify students for specific uh, what eventually become interventions, but they start with preventions uh, at the base. And uh, we've been talking with our staff about the, and engaging them in, in what we should be doing uh, to work effectively to, to stem potential future gang violence as well as uh, what's going on right now. Uh, and let me invite Ms. Swoski to, to uh, describe some of that and she may need to be joined by, uh, by Bud and by Michael as well. Yes, actually, um, Michael Gonzalez asks, yes, Bud is here. He, uh, Bud Andrews had um, been in contact with the principals and was asking them kind of what was going on at their schools as far as the curriculum that we have. Um, too good for drugs at the elementary level and then too good for drugs and alcohol at the secondary level. Any of the curriculum around character education. All of those are, you know, within that first level, that first tier or second tier as, as Dr. Sarvis described and would be considered prevention, certainly. Um, I think I'll let him describe this first and then I want to say something about Dr. Noel's comments before we Just to be clear, what is it that you want me to describe? You were going to contact the principals and ask about the curriculum and how that was going and what actually what they were using for anti um, or kind of there are, the anti-violence. There are two primary curriculums that we use now. One is the life skills, the Botpins life skills and two goods for drug and violence. So all of those are being implemented at the elementary schools around this time. Each of the elementary principals told me in the spring. This was a question that I asked back in September for that program. Uh, the junior highs, they're being implemented in the seventh and eighth grade in different levels. Some health classes, some PE classes, some science classes. And the high schools, they're still using the YSSs or attempting to use the YSSs to uh, do those for the ninth graders primarily. Did they indicate at all um, anything as far as the effectiveness or uh, any kind of no, staff response? No, they haven't. There's a, now, the two goods for drug and violence recently was determined not to be an effective tool. And I, I don't know the history behind it. I just learned this recently myself. So in a, a new uh, grant that we're hoping to apply for, that doesn't apply to ninth grade two goods and drugs and violence anymore. And so there's a list, there's a litany of 
different programs that I still have to discuss with Mr. Gonzalez to find out which one might be best for us. Okay, so, so I'm. After this mm -hmm. year, we won't be able to use two grids and drugs and violence for the ninth graders. Mm -hmm. So probably that what what's worked, what works, clearinghouse, and all the research-based um, programs sounds like that's been changing, and I had heard it, heard that as well. Um, so I guess what what I'm interested in is we can I can have Bud Andrews and Michael, but specifically Bud, um, work with our staff. We could have some you know some of the administrators, teachers. At, at all the levels, particularly at the secondary, um, and and look at the prevention materials. Look maybe at some newer versions. Some of the um, in that report that you mentioned, Dr. Noel, the programs that are that are you know effective to see if there's maybe a substitute we should be putting in. When we're talking about prevention, of course we're we're really looking at for all students, I'm assuming, because once you go beyond prevention and you get up into like the second and third tiers, you're really looking at intervention at that point because it's smaller groups, it's students who have exhibited a much higher need for for something, some kind of support, and it's usually intervention. So for prevention we don't want to um, add yet another kind of anti-gang curriculum or whatever on top of everything else we're trying to fit in. I think what we probably need to look at, and it's, it's probably perfect timing if this program that we're using is no longer considered the best one out there or appropriate for receiving funding, I'm assuming our Title IV funding. Correct. What's um, the name of that program again? The Too Good for Drugs and Violence. In the elementary, it doesn't have the violence on the end of it. It's uh, K-6 is too good for drugs, and then it, it moves on. And then life skills is also in our junior highs. Um, so the question I have then is we can have our staff go ahead and do that. We could have a task force or whatever look at curriculum and, and see what would be most appropriate for that first tier. You mentioned Esperanza and some of the other community organizations. And are you picturing that this group would include some of those outside groups looking at curriculum or just being a part of maybe a quarterly meeting or something about no. what kinds of outside? No. I, I'm, uh, I, ha I have trouble relating that question to mm -hmm. what, what, was, what I had in mind. Uh, let, me, let me just go back. Uh, back then, whenever that was, it's been a long time, uh, I did a lot of digging around and I found two websites that uh, both represented the, uh, uh, the public health model okay, as distinct from an intervention model, and both had extensive reviews of programs rated on effectiveness, research-based ratings on effectiveness. And I thought, this is an amazing resource. Uh, I called one of them, highly rated. Uh, it was dated, and uh, so that made me wonder whether that database, whether that whole system was, you know, how much of it useful, how much use it was, uh, the same thing. I didn't do, I did not do that with the other system, which was actually run or created by uh, President Bush's wife, uh, Miss Laura Bush. Uh, her, you know, she got the title on it, but it was a very, very large system on a federal data, a federal system. I don't, I don't think it was run out of the Department of Education. All right. But both of them stressed this, this thing that was in the Surgeon General's report, the public health model, talking about fat, the, the risk factors for involvement and the protective factors that mitigate the risk factors. And that was just such a different model than the model that underlies our discussion for gang intervention, and, and appropriately, uh, that I thought we should be looking at that and looking to see what's out there that we might be able to, to, to implement. The other side of it is linked to it simply I, I really think that, that any such programs that we do need to do big time outreach to involve parents uh, and, and, get, and to try to get neighborhood involvement. Uh, I, I feel that that's, that's where it has, to, it has to come from there and we're the institution that can make that, make that kind of thing happen. Uh, yes, I, I, and I, I totally agree it. with the parent outreach. I, I, I do believe that. I, I remember reviewing that, um, the document you're talking about at the time as well. Um, I can tell m Mr. Gonzalez wants to say something. Uh, we, in order to get our Title IV funding, 
we do have to have it there's a list of appropriate research based materials that we get to select um, from and we're usually we usually use the guidance of our county office for um, there is a coordinator there Lorraine Waldo who, who yeah. works with the schools on this um, I would imagine that these programs have been updated and they could very well follow this model I don't know if Mr. Gonzalez has more information on that or not. I, I would only share with you that at your direction we can begin to uh, find uh, or, or make a series of recommendations to you based on that Surgeon General's report uh, about curriculum that we might want to employ by grade levels. As Robin just indicated to you, Title IV funding is very restrictive. They will only permit us to use uh, programs that meet Title IV criteria. And so that's a little bit different than the Surgeon General's report. But we could begin to initiate a process that would uh, uh, suggest a number of prevention curriculums by grade levels that uh, could be used in the district, plus uh, give you uh, a cost analysis, and we could begin to go there. But I also want to share that, that if I remember correctly uh, Dr. Noel's uh, comments about this issue. There was, as I recall, some discussion from Dr. Noel about perhaps the creation of a separate committee that would work exclusively on the prevention end of youth violence. Uh, I think that we're well on the way to implementing a intervention strategy with the employment of our outreach uh, coordinator. But I don't think that we've made a concerted, structured effort about gangs and anti-violence uh, by grade level. We have not presented the board member, nor to the superintendent, nor cabinet, a comprehensive plan on what we uh, are best thinking on uh, a prevention curriculum. I guess I guess part of the reason I think separately is because I look at that body, uh, uh, the, the the South Coast Task Force, and I just and and I read the reports and I, and I, and I get the language, the caseload language, and I, and I see this caseworker model, and I, and then I look at the agencies and I think, yeah, it's only natural they they think that way. That those are the intellectual uh, uh, apparatus that they use, uh, and that when you the refreshing thing about this all other approach was simply that it looked at it from an entirely different point of view. And, and where you stand really does affect what you see. And, and, and we, I thought we need, and if, you're, if you do it or are planning to do it, we need just what you said. Uh, whether, whether it's a separate body, I don't know. But, uh, but it needs to be a separate mindset uh, to look at the same, at that problem. I, I, um, th oh. I, I want to go ahead and get other board sure. member comments on this quickly because we're running yes. out of time. Um, Mrs. Cordero. I was just going to suggest that maybe, well, first of all, I, I want to clarify, I'm talking about our district committee on gang uh, prevention and intervention, um, not the South Coast mm -hmm. uh, sort of community-wide uh, committee. But I was wondering if it might be possible to have a subcommittee of for prevention. Um, or, or make them both subcommittees of, a, of an oversight committee. The only, my only concern is I, I don't want to see them disconnected um, because I think too often we have uh, committees in the district who don't know what other committees are necessarily doing. And so I'd like to see those two remain very, very closely connected. Um, while I think it is appropriate that we can look at each issue sort of separately and, and very f specifically focus on one or the other, but I, I don't want to see them, I really don't want to see them be totally separate from, from each other. Thank you. Any other <coughs> board member comments? Mm -hmm. Mrs. Um, Deacon? I guess one of my concerns, and, and I don't know what structure this would actually take, although that sounds like one that, that might very well work, is that um, it wouldn't be a top-down kind of process, but a bottom-up process, because one of my concerns with the South Coast Task Force was it seems so top-heavy, where the people that are really involved you know, on the streets are not represented, and so if, if we're going to 
to develop something. I'd like to really find a way to funnel, you know, information and I good ideas directly from those people that are that are participating or involved, in, you know, at that level. And it, it triggers a thought that I had reading the Safe School Plan. Um, there was a survey of ninth and eleventh grade students that talked about, you know, a whole range of behaviors, not necessarily just violence, but drug abuse. And one of the questions asked students, you know, did you choose not to participate in these destructive behaviors because of, and it listed a whole series of intervention programs, and, and the majority of them, over the 50 percent, said, no, I decided not to participate in them before I was even exposed to these programs. Now, maybe that was happening earlier, hopefully, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure. sure, you know, and those are the kinds of questions that we could go to students and ask or, you know, um, people like that. So that's just a thought. Mr. Aaron? Yeah. I'd be interested in how your committee is doing. Uh, we haven't heard since we've been on the board. And so, not, we'll not now, I don't want to hear. We'll bring you But at some point, I'd like to yeah. hear an update of just what's happening with that committee. We will bring you a report. Uh, actually, the subcommittee idea, uh, to my mind, fits rather nicely because we do have on that committee Esperanza, we have Jackie Inda on that committee, we have Los Compadres on that committee. I mean, we have. We have a lot of the, the players who would be involved. Yeah, I, I just want to yes. endorse what Mrs. Cordero suggested. Okay, good I think idea. it's a great idea. All right, thank you, thank you. Um, we will now move to item D13. Brad, if uh, we're returning to consent items designated for discussion, D13 was pulled by Mr. Heron. On page two of the report, uh, one seven. $80,000 from the parcel tax. And then it says, this will help fund our math, art, and music programs. It, it doesn't sound like they're talking about supplement them. It sounds like, it, do, they, do they know, uh, Mr. Smith? Do they know that they, I mean, I thought they were under the props, uh, parcel tax I, under the same constraints that that we, we told Absolutely. the public. Absolutely, it's, it's supplement, not supplant. And we'll convey that to them just in case there's any com and miscommunication. And doesn't the Citizens Committee oversight? Absolutely. They, they're not exempted from that. They're under their peer review. Yeah. Okay. And, they're, and they'll be ultimately under our peer review That's for that. That's correct. However, yeah. they're just not participating in, in the same structure of programs but, that we're doing. Yeah. But Proposition I, well, and they, and they have to, I mean, they have to, they just can't take our money, no, take the citizens' money, and just spend it how they want to spend it. They'll have to develop a plan, and that plan will be subject to the oversight of both the oversight committee and the board. Thank you. I'll move, I'll move to approve D13. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 It passes unanimously. And with that, we move to Item H, coming events, which Dr. Sarvis already gave a lengthy list of. Um, and then measure, uh, sorry, item I, board comments and correspondence. Uh, Mrs. Deegan? I just have a quick question. I really enjoy reading the uh, Santa Barbara High School student newspaper, and I'm wondering if we could get the newspapers from the other high schools on a regular sure. basis. that would be great. Any other board comments or correspondence? I just uh, would like to mention two other things that I saw recently. And, you know, one I loved is that the Dons ride the perfect wave into state into the state meet. We have a surfing championship at Santa Barbara High School. I thought that was unique. And then you have to you have to love the Roosevelt School and their loop de coupe. That was so I mean, cute. I can't believe the coverage they got. I hope they made some money. <laughs> but uh, it was a fantastic uh, coverage on that. And uh, I went by a couple of the places from the street. I didn't pay to go in, but I went from the street, and they had a lot of activity. So I thought those two were very good. I'd also like to say I'd like to thank Mimi. Um, I noticed this is the second time I've seen the attachments uh, along with the agenda on Friday. And I know that you can't do that all the time, but I think the public appreciates it. So thank you for doing that. The fact that it was there, I mean, I think the, pu I think the public appreciates that. Yeah. Yes. Okay, and now we're on to J, future agenda items. <coughs> a 
anybody like to share? Mr. Heron? Uh, I'm curious, on the uh, board agenda, it says we have a workshop in April. Do we have a date for that? Uh, we don't have a yes. workshop in April. We That's have a right. special meeting. Okay, special meeting. And it's April, April 21st. 21st. Oh, yeah. I, I, it's shown it's under K. Under K. Oh, okay. Mimi, do you recall the start time? Oh, it's 4 o'clock. Okay. Because <laughs> that's the one that has the dinner. It's at that's the dinner at Lacumba, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I, I'd also like to put on the. No, we're not on future agenda. Are we on future? We agenda? are on future agenda okay. right now. Um, I would like on, a, on hopefully the next agenda, this um, topic of intra district transfers. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a ton of communication going around, and I'd like to um, discuss that. Okay. Um, I have some others that I'd like to bring up. One is uh, Dr. Noel's uh, sort of a report on vandalism. I think that would be a great uh, future agenda item um, I have that. to talk about vandalism. Yeah. So you have that down. Also, uh, board bylaw, I believe it's 9006, um, the governing board's code of ethics. I'd like a discussion on that. Uh, and Are we including that in the special board meeting on no. the 21st? No. No? No, it's in the 9,000 series. That's just on 5,000s and 6,000s, I believe. Um, and then also uh, uh, the development of alternative programs to serve students transferring from program improvement schools as a future agenda item. Do we want to set a time frame for the board self-evaluation? We're going to be putting that, the instrument out for comment, possibly. Um, that's going to be coming up. Sorry. Uh, it should be coming uh, to all board members, the, the work that Mrs. Deacon and Dr. Noel have been doing on the evaluation instrument. Uh, we should get that in the next board brief. Um, and uh, we'll certainly have uh, a week or so timeline uh, to get comments back on it so maybe Towards I'm reluctant well yeah. I'm, I'm actually reluctant to put it on either one of the agendas in April because of the budget issues so I think it'll probably be May but hopefully early May okay um, and wow all right it's a German time we're number K so <laughs> we are at letter K with no uh, objections from board members this meeting is adjourned <laughs>